I write this account with a heavy heart, a tale born from the shadows of a mission that blurred the lines between duty and the haunting specters of war. We were a Navy SEAL sniper team, deployed behind enemy lines in Israel, working in tandem with Israeli commandos. Our objective was clear, gather intel, disrupt enemy operations, and remain unseen in the unforgiving landscapes of Gaza. Day is turned into nights and nights into endless stretches of silence. As we lay concealed in the shadows, our camouflage blending seamlessly with the harsh terrain, the psychological toll of remaining hidden, observing the ebb and flow of life on the other side, was as exhausting as any physical demand our training had prepared us for. My gaze remained fixed through the scope, observing the eons, old dance between the cities, the sounds of distant prayers mixed with the occasional bursts of gunfire echoed through the air. It was an eerie symphony, a testament to the perpetual struggle that unfolded beyond our hidden vantage point. One moonlit night the tranquility shattered. A whisper in the wind carried tales of an enemy sniper, a phantom in Gaza known for his mind games. His reputation preceded him, tales of psychological warfare that left adversaries questioning their own sanity. The silence morphed into a surreal anticipation as we became aware of an unseen adversary playing a deadly game of cat and mouse. Days turned into sleepless nights, with each member of our sniper team taking turns on watch. We felt the unseen eyes of the enemy, a disconcerting presence that transcended the physical realm. Shadows seemed to move independently, and every shift in the wind carried a threat we couldn't quite grasp. Then it happened. A shot, distant yet thunderous, echoed through the silence. The bullet narrowly missed one of our own, a chilling reminder that we were not alone in the darkness. The mind games had begun. As the days passed, the psychological warfare escalated. Whispers in the dark, shapes that danced at the edge of our vision, and the relentless anticipation of an unseen adversary weighed on our minds. The line between friend and foe blurred in the obsidian night. Survival became our only mission. The enemy sniper, elusive as a phantom, kept us on edge, wondering if the next step we took would be our last. It was a game of wits, and we were pawns in a deadly chess match played on the borders of war. In the end, we survived, but the scars were etched, not just on our bodies, but on our souls. As I looked out over the contested land, I couldn't help but wonder, would our encounter with the elusive sniper impact the overall war between Israel and Palestine? Was the psychological trauma we endured a microcosm of the larger, enduring struggle that echoed through the ages? The war continued, a relentless force that swept through the land like an unyielding tide. Our mission was a drop in the vast ocean of conflict, a story whispered in the hidden corners of a war-torn world. As I left the shadows behind, I carried the weight of those days with me wondering if our encounter with the phantom sniper would ripple through the annals of history, a fleeting moment in the eternal dance between nations. My cousin and I were on our way home from an event one evening, and decided to take the lake roads home because it was dusk and we knew the lake would look so pretty and serene. The particular lake we drove around is still decently surrounded by the woods, so there are lots of dense areas. We were driving past this giant field next to the lake that was lined with trees or woods on three sides when she screamed at me to stop the car and back up. Her scream practically made me jump out of my skin, but I agreed and backed up confused. She looked all frantic, so I asked her why she made us back up, and she claimed she saw some kind of animal, but it wasn't a normal animal. She said it was standing on its back legs like a bear, and that it was huge and covered in white fur. Whatever it was wasn't there by the time we'd backed up. 
She's kind of a skeptical person, and I'm more the one who believes in the crazy stuff, so seeing her so freaked out had me thinking she definitely had to have seen something. And I knew there was a legend of the Lake Worth monster in that general area that dates back to, I think, maybe the 60s. So my brain immediately jumped on that. The next time I saw her, we both got on Google so she could see what comes up when you type that in. I'll never forget the way her mouth dropped open. She claimed it looked just like what she saw. This was a few years ago when this happened, so I don't know if other people have had any recent experiences or not, because I haven't heard anything. But it's something I'll definitely never forget. I was walking through a majestic redwoods forest in California, soaking in the tranquility and beauty of nature. Little did I know that my peaceful hike would take a dramatic turn, plunging me into a heart, pounding encounter that would leave me questioning everything. As I strolled along the winding path, the forest embraced me with its towering trees and the gentle rustling of leaves. Suddenly a noise shattered the serene ambience jolting me from my reverie. My senses heightened and my heart skipped a beat. Something was approaching, something fast. Before I could react, a massive figure burst into view, sprinting at an incredible speed. It was a Bigfoot. In those fleeting seconds, the enormity of the situation struck me and fear gripped my every thought. My rifle resting casually on my shoulder was now a stark reminder of my vulnerability. It remained there untouched and useless, as the Bigfoot swiftly disappeared into the depths of the woods. The encounter happened so abruptly and unexpectedly that there was no chance for me to raise my weapon and defend myself. The realization sent shivers down my spine, but what perplexed me even more was the reason behind the Bigfoot's panic. What could have scared such a creature? Its wild sprint through the forest conveyed a sense of urgency, as if it was fleeing from something relentless. The creature seemed completely unbothered by my presence, as if humans were inconsequential in its world. My mind raced with questions. What unknown danger had crossed paths with the Bigfoot? Was there a larger threat lurking in the depths of the forest, unseen and menacing, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of awe, curiosity, and deep unease. It was 2007. I was with a couple of my friends camping. I was 16 and was just with some 16, 18 year olds on this fun camping trip out in the woods behind some of these guys' houses. We picked a spot in the clearing where it would be like a little party kind of sight, although I don't do drugs or even smoke weed or any of that. I grew up with that going on all around me, so I tried to avoid it, but nobody brought weed or anything along, I don't think. So we all hung out in this clearing with three different tents set up and with a fire pit in the middle. We had planned to spend four, five days. It was summer vacation, so we didn't have school. I think this was early August. Anyway, we all decided to hang out in the clearing roasting marshmallows and everyone but me having beers. I sat around making s'mores and the sun was just beginning to set and we were all having a good time. At around seven or so, we heard something moving in the bushes nearby and someone threw an empty beer bottle at the bushes. We heard the smash and watched something climb out of the bushes and lumber back into the trees. We thought it was just some psycho person, but everyone got a little bit nervous. Later that night, I was asleep in the tent with three other people. The only person I knew was my friend, Paul, who invited me along. I remember everything being silent, and then I heard a sort of popping sound by the fire. and We all sat up, crawling out. We could hear people in the other tent's voices saying the F was that. Paul unzipped the tent and we crawled out. The fire, which we had put out at about an hour or two ago, was now roaring with flames. We put it out and thought maybe someone poured gasoline all over the fire and lit a match or lighter and lit the fire. But we never heard the gas pouring or a match being struck lighter being flicked. We also didn't hear anybody running away because we would have heard them. 
It was at this point there was an awful smell, but had a stuffy nose and couldn't make it out really. It may have been a skunk, but Paul said one of the other guys said, it was like rotten meat, but we had not smelled it earlier or since. Some other people began holding their shirts up to their noses as if a pungent smell had just appeared. We were all a little on edge, but I guess some people agreed if it. Let's just stay here. Nobody brought any guns to fend ourselves off, but one guy, who was about 18, said he had a pocket knife. Our second day here, nothing happened until it became night again. At around 4 a.m., we were all fast asleep and awoken by noises behind our tent. We started to get out when Paul said, shut the fuff up for a minute. We sat in silence listening to the noises, which sounded like voices I couldn't make out. The voices seemed to be coming closer to us, and we quietly climbed out of the tent. The voices still approaching our camp. The two other guys in our tent crept to the other tents and woke the other people up, telling them to get out here at once. All thirteen of us stood quietly listening to the voices get closer and louder. At the point where they had gotten behind our tent, we heard the voices stop, but an eerie humming noise was coming from the trees all around us. One of the guys, I think named Ben, who was 17 or 18, walked to about 10 feet from the tree line where the voices had been coming from. He said, Oi, who is there? Then we quietly waited for a response. We heard nothing except distant crickets. He walked back to us, and right then we heard the voices moving away, which to me sounded like what Ben had asked Oi. Who's there? But it didn't sound like Ben moving away, almost like something was trying to mimic what he sounded like. I could hear the voice sort of crackly and jumpy repeating those words as it moved off into the distance. We all got back to our tents, but didn't sleep. The next day, someone had left to their house to grab something. They came back a little later with a potato gun saying he'd shoot the F out of the thing bothering our campsite. Around 7 p.m., not really partying, but just huddled around the fire, a girl, just one of two, stands up, practically pissing herself, and we find out what's wrong. Here's one of the similarities I found with the well-known Goatman story. She said that last night, when we were listening to voices, there was another person with us. There was 13 of us now, but she insisted that there had been a 14th. Reading the Anansi Goat Man story and connecting that experience later made my butt clench. We all started to get nervous again, and Ben told us he was going to run back to his house. He and Potato Gun Guy were neighbors, and he said he was going to get his father to come out here with a gun and wait. Someone went with him, and Paul and I were just talking to each other about how we could leave early. If shit got too chaotic, which is was starting to get to now. We were in the middle of talking about how we should pack up when we saw Ben standing in the woods. It was clearly him with his blue hoodie and jeans, and he was looking straight at us from about 40 feet away. But we didn't know what the fee was doing. The person who went with him wasn't standing next to him. It was just him standing alone watching us. It was a 25-minute walk back to his house, but he couldn't have been back five minutes later. Everyone got really uncomfortable, and people started yelling, Hey, Ben, what are you doing? But he just kept watching us. We watched as he seemed to slink back into the trees. By now, people were scared out of their minds, and I was, too. Why was Ben being a prick and just staring at us and not doing anything? We decided to pile into one tent and wait. A short while later, the other Ben turned up with his dad and the other person that went with him and his dad was holding a hunting rifle. Ben told him what happened with the voices and the father walked that way into the trees and took a look around. He said it felt like eyes were watching him from every direction. Paul then told Ben's dad that we just saw another Ben standing in the woods staring at us. Ben's dad walked over there and looked around too. He came back and said he could stay with us in the gun, but said he would control it because if we got drunk and started shooting a gun around, we'd all kill ourselves. He slept in Ben's tent. It was our third night here, and it was really creepy. We quietly listened for it being anywhere nearby. Paul had a funny look in his eyes and started sweating. He later told me that while we were all sitting around, he saw a strange figure moving through the woods, moving its arms around in a strange, jumpy motion. 
Around 2 a.m., we were all going to get ready for bed, and we heard it. It was saying something, but in a highish voice. It sounded like it was saying, Oi, who's there? Completely mimicking what Ben had said the night before. Ben's dad tried to pinpoint where the voice was coming from and fired a shot into the trees. That gunshot was loud as if. Right after, we could hear a creepy chanting like male voice. I was scared. Paul was scared. Everyone was. The chanting sounded like a deep voice chanting, so not multiple people. Underneath the chanting, we could hear something mumbling noises. Again, another shot was fired, but I saw what Ben's dad was shooting at. It was a figure crouched low by some bushes. It looked like a direct hit, but the figure did not move. Instead, it stood up, sort of hunched over, and moved back into the forest. We raced back into our tents, and I could hear crying and moaning coming from right behind our tent. All four of us in the tent were getting scared, and then I could kind of smell a strong vinegar smell that was very powerful. Then I noticed what looked like fingertips moving along the tent wall and to the door and moved down the zipper to grab the part you used to open. Paul dove over to the zipper and held it down as whoever or whatever tried to pull it open. Paul and one other guy in the tent started yelling, Who's out there? And after a minute we could hear a screeching noise as this thing took off into the darkness. We decided to save the fourth and fifth day. Let's get out of here in the morning. Here's the scariest experience of that night. At 3.45 a.m., checking my watch, I had to go pee. Since what had just occurred not long ago, I decided I wasn't getting out of the tent and maybe I could stick my bird out of a small zipper opening. But then I pictured whatever it was out there biting or ripping my thing off, so I decided to open up the tent, slither outside just slightly and pee to the side of the door. As soon as I was finished, I noticed someone by the furthest tent away. I grabbed my flashlight beside my pillow and turned it on and shined it towards the person. It looked like Paul back-facing to me, hunched over by the tent. But Paul was right behind me sleeping in the tent. I crawled back inside but kept my light shined on the other Paul. I whispered, Paul, wake up. And the moment he did, I looked outside to see the other Paul stand up and turn facing toward me and stare at me. I dove back in and leapt under my sleeping bag and huddled there awake as I explained to Paul what I had just seen. I guess at one point in the night I was facing another way and was freaking out, but one of the guys in the tent said he woke up, eyes still half closed as he rolled over. He could see. The other Paul looking through the part in the tent flap I didn't close. He thought it was just Paul coming to wake them up, but realized the real Paul was asleep right beside him. We packed up and left. I had spent 20 years in park in recreational management. Currently serving in the National Park Service as a superintendent, I've seen and heard many strange things while working in the backcountry. This email is to report an encounter I had with a cat thing while in the backcountry. This occurred during the winter of 2010 and going into 2011. It was in the early afternoon. I left the ranger cabin and traveled four and a half miles up the trail to a backcountry emergency shelter. This shelter is a replacement of the original shelter, which burned down in the late 1980s. It had been seen by many users, but the last six years especially, I had really been the only person to stay there. I arrived at the shelter by 4 p.m. and immediately got my gear outside. I was working on my snowshoes when I heard a distant bellowing howl. It was a howl that I never heard before. I am very well versed in all the howls of wolf coyotes and other animals. But this was different, way different. It was much deeper, had a lot more growl and distortion to the timber. It was definitely not a wolf, elk, bear, or any mammal that I'm familiar with. For the matter, the noise was a bellow howl that went for about a minute with a slight pause between the bellows and howls. It was a very, very strong howl. But also, as terrified as I was by hearing this, I was curious. I grabbed my pack and my snowshoes, began walking toward the source of the vocalization. 
I walked about three, fourths of a mile to a large rise on the ridge line. As I walked towards the ridge, that's when I began to notice several deer carcasses. Deer, by the way, are abundant in the area. I see them all the time. We actually have several types, but the most common is white tail. I immediately thought something was hunting them. Upon closer inspection, the three visible carcasses I've seen were very horribly mutilated. What's also more strange is that the corpses were not eaten on. They were just ripped up. The doe, the closest one that I was to, had her neck ripped open and her head was missing. Something visibly tore this animal's head off, but there were no bite marks or claw marks on the animal. It just seemed like a brutal kill. Something wasn't right. As that thought is in my head, I hear and notice the bellow howl again, and this time it appeared more powerful and closer. I decided to get up the ridge and see if I could see what was responsible, assuming that the bellowing and howling was the creature responsible. I quickly moved up the ridge, but as I neared the top, the bellows and howls happened again. Only this time they were getting even closer. I approached the ridge top and heard the noise coming from a small meadow. As I looked across the small meadow, I, I noticed this creature. It was standing on the other side of the ridge top. It was this strange-looking thing. I call it a cat because that's the closest that it resembled. But it was far too distorted, far too different. It was much more like if you mixed a person or a human being with a lion and a mountain lion. I very visibly remember the brindle coloring and the mane around its neck. It was definitely larger than a mountain lion. The animal was facing my direction, but at about a 45-degree angle. I could see its front quarters very well. As I watched it staring at it intently, it never appeared to move, and the sound it was making completely stopped. And the entire time I was staring at it, I was trying to process what animal am I seeing, but I could not make it out. It was on all fours and looked very, very strange. I want to say I was probably there for five minutes, but in actuality... I was probably only staring at it for maybe 30 seconds, at 45 at most. The thought had occurred to me that I better leave now, before whatever this giant cat is notices me and decides to make me its next meal or do what it did to the deer. Now as I'm going down the ridge line, I could hear something coming up the hill behind. I turned around and looked up the trail. There were two deer running. When I turned back down, I could see the cat now moving in my direction. So I walked quickly to the far edge of the ridge and saw this thing now walking about 75 yards. As it walked up the hill, it would stop every few steps and look back at me. It continued this walking, looking behavior until it was completely out of sight, far over the ridge line. I stayed there for about five minutes and I never heard it bellow or howl again after that. I very hastily walked back down the hill, packed up my gear, and began my six-mile walk back all the way around the cabin, the long way. I've never seen this creature again, and I think it's safe to presume that this was the creature's territory and it was hunting the deer, because the portion of backcountry I was on, that entire ridgeline, is very untouched. It was a portion even I'm very unfamiliar with. As the years have gone on, I've told a few friends and colleagues. They're convinced I just saw a mountain lion from far away. But if it really was a mountain lion, we're talking about a severely deformed mountain lion, I know what mountain lions look like. This was not it. I have seen many mountain lions in my career. I do think it was hunting the deer on the ridge line, and possibly I irritated it. I've also come across several other eyewitness stories similar to mine describing a creature very similar in the National Park Service, but have never come across any real concrete evidence of its existence other than my one eyewitness story that I have myself. And this is why I'm sending you my email. I've never heard of any cryptid sightings in the Smokies, but I have seen and heard of several unexplained phenomena. Several of my co-workers have also, at different times, witnessed strange lights over the mountains at night time. In fact, there was one instance where a park ranger, a friend of mine, and his girlfriend saw a UFO over the park. 
I myself have never seen such a thing, but I take his word for it. He's an older gentleman, single, not married, and has no reason to fabricate any story, nor is he much of a storyteller or jokester. He's also very, very serious, especially when he tells that story. He went into more detail and described it like a large black triangle craft that kind of hovered over the park and then just faded out, as in it just went translucent and disappeared. I know there's a lot of weird stuff that occurs out here, my sighting and experience included. Keep up the good work. I was riding back from a three-day stint out in the desert with my squad. We were assigned to protect a convoy that was carrying vital supplies for our own troops. I don't know what it was exactly, but they told us if anything happened to those trucks, then the war would have been even more devastating than what it already is. I just work as an officer, not some military strategist. Anyhow, being out there in the open desert with nothing but you and your squad mate is pretty disconcerting, at least to me anyway, with all these strange sounds coming from everywhere. One can easily get scared, especially during night patrols when everything falls deathly silent. Except it was not, as I was leading the convoy through our last night patrol for those three long days without any incident. Or trouble from anyone. We were just about to call off the guard duty and rest up for a little bit when it happened. It was me who spotted them first as my squad mate slept. As usual, I had to take watch. They weren't exactly hard to miss with all their lights and everything, but there were four of them. These big, bright, metallic yellow orbs that kept following us everywhere, even if we tried to hide behind the hills and other obstacles. Their position was given away easily enough. I told my team members, but they didn't believe me at first until they saw them, too. They said these things must be scouts from an opposing military force. I was not so sure, and neither were they. We did not see any other military personnel that night. These things made their way to us slowly, but we remained calm. That is, until they began glowing brighter and more intensely. It then dawned on all of us what exactly these mysterious floating orbs were. The next thing we heard was a loud screeching sound coming from one of the things, and immediately after another one started doing the same, while two others remained silent. This went on for minutes before they suddenly sped off towards our base, which sat miles away from where we currently were. We did not know if whatever gave them such bright light had caused damage to our camp or worse infiltrated it, and by the time we got there an hour later, everything seemed normal. We even questioned our commanders, and they confirmed that there was indeed a sort of strange light that came from the direction of where we were patrolling, but they did not know what it was. All I can remember is them telling us to forget about it, to get back to our homes, for we were dismissed by the higher-ups. It only took me a moment to realize what exactly those lights were, before my squad mates told me that they were pulled in by their superiors, and they weren't lying. I'm a professional trucker named Merle, and my days are spent on the road, transporting goods across vast distances. On one particular night, I found myself cruising along a desolate highway in the heart of New Mexico. The darkness enveloped the landscape, and the only company I had was the hum of the engine and the occasional flicker of passing headlights. As I drove, my eyes caught sight of something peculiar in the distance, a pair of glowing lights. Curiosity peaked. I maintained my course, steadily closing the gap between us. The lights grew brighter, revealing the outline of a massive creature occupying the road. Its sheer size was astounding, standing at a towering nine feet. The breadth of its shoulders alone could span four feet, showcasing the immense power it possessed. Even from a distance I could make out the details of its form. Stringy hair clung to its body, but beneath the wiry strands, I glimpsed the rippling of muscles flexing with each movement. 
Its thighs were as robust as tree trunks, exuding an aura of raw strength. The creature's neck was hardly discernible, leading up to a conical-shaped head that seemed to merge characteristics of a gorilla and a Neanderthal man. Its long arms swung with an otherworldly grace, emphasizing the creature's uncanny blend of primal and humanoid traits. As I approached, my instincts told me to slow down. I cautiously brought my truck to a halt. To my disbelief, I watched as the creature feasted upon a coyote, tearing into its lifeless body with a ferocious hunger. The sight was both awe-inspiring and disturbing, a primal reminder of the harsh realities that exist beyond our daily lives. Suddenly, as if sensing my presence, the creature's gaze snapped towards me, its eyes locked with mine, and it emitted a bone-chilling shriek that pierced the night air. Without hesitation, the creature sprinted towards the nearby woods with a speed and agility resembling that of a human. Its departure left behind the grotesque tableau of a dead coyote sprawled across the road. I sat there in stunned silence, my heart racing as I tried to comprehend what I'd just witnessed. After a moment, I mustered the courage to step out of the truck and approach the lifeless coyote. My curiosity overwhelmed my fear, and I inspected the remains, hoping to find some clue to the nature of this enigmatic creature. The torn flesh and scattered bones only deepened the mystery, leaving me with more questions than answers. An eerie chill ran down my spine, and a wave of trepidation washed over me. Hastily, I retreated to the safety of my truck, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. In that moment, I made a silent vow to myself, swearing off alcohol forever. The encounter with that creature had shaken me to my core. I work as a ranger here in Arizona, and I went backpacking to the Grand Canyon this past October. I put on the most conservative clothes I could, thinking I would blend into the landscape the best. I did not even shave for three days. And kidding, I'm just trying to make a funny and lighten the story. I had a three-day permit and just hiked into the Grand Canyon, hiking along the southern rim and camping at the bottom. I a day hiked back and out at the end of the permit. I did run across more people than I thought I would. Figured I would have a better chance of telling my story to people who aren't from around here, so I kept my permit for three days. As stopping in the El Tover Hotel for dinner, I decided to sit at the bar and talk to the folks next to me, who happened to be Canadians. I told them I was a ranger, and we were talking about the Grand Canyon and backpacking for a little while. Then one of the guys that I was talking to told me he had a really strange experience in the canyon a few years ago. I thought to myself, here we go. Okay, I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions, get some more details, and write it down in my journal. He went on to say that they went into the Grand Canyon a few years back and were coming up the South Kyber Trail, bouncing down the trail and enjoying the day. When his friend saw a man running from a fire behind him up the hill, very panicking, frantic, and he said to his friend, this guy who's apparently barely clothed and had a very manic, crazy look to his face, went right by them, did not see anything, did not even acknowledge their existence. He said that his friend and him had a very weird feeling and kept moving. There was a river running along the trail, and there was a bridge that goes over the river. They came across the fire department there, putting out a campfire that had grown out of control. They almost wonder if the man that walked past them was the man who started the fire and was retreating. So as they kept going, going down the trail, it was now beginning to get dark about five miles. They were also about 6,000 feet, and they both saw a huge dark figure standing in front of a rock. It was blocking their way. Almost what frightened them the most was along against a rock as they made their way down to the bottom. They both described a large, dark figure, black skin, huge red eyes, about nine feet tall and moving on two legs like a man. They just kept moving, trying to stay calm and get to the bottom. Again, it was also very dark, and they had three more miles to go. 
Once they got there to the bottom, they were knocking on the door frantically, and a park ranger came to the door, asking them if everything was okay. They weren't sure if they saw a bear or what, but I guess the ranger was convinced they just saw a large bear. Even though they were adamant about what they saw, and that it was not a bear or a misidentification, and how terrified and shook they were. I thought you might find their story interesting. They told me they never told anybody about it because they were convinced they were going to be the laughingstock. But they had also told me, too, in conversation, they have some friends who are Apache and Navajo, and both admit there's some pretty questionable things going on down in the canyon, even more so at night. It's probably best to stay away. I'll give you my creepiest camping story. It was over 20 years ago in southern Missouri. Me, 17, and a friend, 16, were out camping. We were at least a mile and a half from our truck. We were also at least two miles from the nearest farmhouse. We had set up camp in a small clearing in dense old growth. Clearing was only about 25 feet across. Our fire and lantern light reached the trees, but couldn't penetrate into them. It was dense, and yet still had a lot of undergrowth. It was almost midnight, and we were about to go to sleep when we started hearing movement near the camp. It didn't sound like a deer or coyotes. It sounded more like a heavy person walking around. We were armed, but we were getting really nervous. My friend called out, Who's there? And the walking stopped. Then we heard hoo-hoo, ah, to one side. Then on the opposite side, we heard a very similar call. It almost sounded like something you'd hear a chimpanzee or an ape make. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. My friend's eyes were huge, and he mouthed, What the F was that? At me, I shrugged. I had no clue what that was. We were shining our lights at the trees, but even our flashlights couldn't penetrate the forest. My friend yelled out again, Who the F is out there? And that's when it got even weirder. We heard the hoo-hoo, ah, call again. But this time it was followed up with an ear-shattering crack. It sounded like something was slamming a tree with another freaking tree. It was loud, about as loud as a rifle shot. Then it happened two more times, just as loud. It did not sound far off, yet we still couldn't see anything in our lights. There was again another answering call from the opposite side of the camp. That one seemed to be coming from farther away than it did the first time, though. It also seemed to have moved around a little closer to the first one. We were still shining our lights around, but never did see anything. Didn't even make out any movement in the light. It was just too dense. We kept hearing movement in the woods, but it was moving away from us. After a little bit, all was quiet again. We never did sleep that night. The only thing I can equate the calls we heard that night are to a chimpanzee or an ape. It's the only thing I've ever heard that sounds similar to what we heard that night. Yet it wasn't exactly the same as chimps or an ape's. Those loud cracks we heard sounded like a wooden baseball bat hitting a tree. But way louder... I've heard cougars, coyotes, deer calls, and everything else native to southern Missouri, and still I had never heard this before. And still haven't heard anything like it since. I still don't know what we heard that night. Probably never will. This happened back in 2011 to my dad. His job involves a lot of travel, so he's almost always driving alone from sunrise to early dawn, depending on the time zone. When he stops at a restaurant around 8 in the evening, he frequently places his things on a table and proceeds to the toilet. By the time he gets back to his table, he notices two servings of complimentary soup. He questions the staff why they place two bowls of soup when he's the only traveling the staff puzzlingly replies that when my dad went to the toilet, a long-haired lady dressed in white exited the car and proceeded to the toilet as well. He just brushes it off, finishes his meal, and then continues with his travels, but not before one of the staff cautions him to be careful. 
While driving, a suddenly downpour obscures his vision, and just when he was about to make a curve, one of his front tires breaks off. Thankfully, he managed to control the car and manages to stop the vehicle, which was inches away from falling into a deep ravine. So it's 2 a.m., dark and raining really hard. He grabs a flashlight, searches for his tire, does some makeshift repairs, and hobbles the car to the nearest town for repairs. I don't, if the two events were related. When my dad told me about what happened, I immediately thought that he might have encountered Banshee, a spirit that heralds death. But it's a big world out there who knows. I was about ten, twelve when it happened. Can't remember exactly. I was coming home from school, and as I entered my building, an unfamiliar man in a black jacket followed me inside and started walking up the stairs behind me. I wasn't spooked out because I had lots of neighbors and often saw people I didn't know. The thing was, I live in a flat that is in the very top part of the building, and no one else lives on that level. So when the man didn't stop by the last flat below mine, I was immediately alarmed. But being a 10 or 12 year old, I didn't do or say anything and just kept nearing my flat, hoping that maybe he was an acquaintance of my parents. I don't recall exactly how I felt, but I know I was not nearly as terrified as I should have been. He was on the landing when I reached the door. I rang the bell and my sister opened. The moment the man saw that there was someone inside, he turned around without a word and started walking downstairs. Relieved as hell, I hurried inside. My sister, 15, 17 at the time, noticed the man and asked who that was, and I just mumbled I didn't know. We never talked about it again and didn't even tell our parents. It was only some time later that I realized just how badly it could have ended if the flat had been empty. Pretty sure we saw a dead body floating in the water once around 17 miles east of the Treasure Coast in Florida. We had just finished up a great day of offshore trolling for Mahi and were heading back in shore, running about 25 knots. We weren't paying very much attention at the time as we were in the open water and primarily using the GPS for navigation. I'm not sure what caused me to look. But as we are cruising along, I happened to look off the port side of the boat and saw a yellow blob about six foot in length floating on the surface of the water. I alerted the captain. We slowed down and turned around to go back and check. It was starting to get late and the sun was almost completely down. We were unable to find what I'd just seen, so we continued our trip back to shore. Two days later, I saw an article in our local paper about a fisherman who had been recovered from the water, and he was dressed in yellow slicks with a yellow rain jacket. When they pulled him from the water, I'm convinced his body was the yellow object I had seen on our trip. When I was in high school, I was really into photography. Around this time, I was 14 years old and a freshman. A few years prior, our family had moved in a new subdivision outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Our subdivision backed up against a large forested area, and the entire surrounding area was largely a mix of forests and farms. One of my hobbies was to dress up in camo and hang out back in the woods with my camera, trying to take photos of wildlife, deer, foxes, shit, even squirrels. There isn't exactly a lot of exotic wildlife in Wisconsin. I had been doing this for a while at this point and had constructed, no joke, a sort of ghillie suit out of old army BDUs and some deer blind material cut and pinned around my body. I even had segments of blind material on my camera. One day I'm making my way back out of the woods to the road that dead ends into the woods from our subdivision a small part of our subdivision, was older, maybe 1980s era. This short road or spur came from this older part of the subdivision, penetrated maybe 100, 200 feet into the woods, and ended. 
If you were entering the woods from the road, you would drop down a few feet into the woods after stepping off the asphalt. Coming out of the woods, I had just reached the bottom of this short incline to make my way up onto the street when I saw him, an old man standing there, alone, staring at the ground at the end of the dead end. I still don't know why I froze. The neighborhood was friendly. Everyone said hi to everyone. I still can't imagine why I wouldn't continue up the road and say hello. Instead, I froze and then, almost automatically, took a step backward, almost as if I had hoped to blend back into the woods. I stood there watching the man. He was looking at the ground, thinking like he was contemplating something. Then, out of nowhere, he said, And I shit you not, I will never forget these words. Man. I spit on his grave, he hawks a loogie and spits on the ground. A few more moments passed with him looking at the ground. I finally mustered up some courage and stepped forward a few steps, pretending like I hadn't just been standing there but was working my way out of the woods. After three steps, my movement caught his eye. He seemed somewhat startled and slightly annoyed aggressive as he responded to my hello with a well hello. You certainly like to sneak up there on people, don't you? His tone was assertive, like an old grandpa about to scold you. I apologized, and we spoke for a minute or two about what I was doing in the woods. Then he wrapped up the conversation, got in a car that I remember being something an old man would drive, a Buick or something, and drove off. As he drove off, I snapped a photo of his license plate. I turned around, walked back to five steps or so we had drifted from where I saw him standing, and on the ground, in the dirt, was this weird symbol. I can only describe it. It was a triangle with a cross on top of it, and the letter C inscribed inside the circle. I took a photo of it, too. I still have no idea what any of it was about. This was 2001, before the Internet was really as robust as it is today when it comes to finding random things like this. All I know, there are processed and stored Kodak Tri-X 300 negatives of the photos I took of the symbol and his license plate stashed somewhere back at my parents' house in Wisconsin. If anyone has any ideas, I'll be head back for Christmas. Maybe I should dig them up. Navy sonar technician here. I've heard weird shit all over the world. One time, while doing a deployment to Asia, we were steaming west on our way to Singapore, Iark, and it was about 17 local time, right after chow. Me and a buddy are shooting the shit in sonar control on watch, just me and him down there, and the underwater comm starts chirping. Dolphins, no big deal, they like to ride the boat and make a bunch of noise next to the sonar array. Trust me, you get used to that shit. We continue shooting the shit talking about stuff back home, what food we miss, that kind of thing. Suddenly we hear this really low grumble, and we actually thought someone was around with a 1MC, the ship's general announcing system, because it sounded like someone was dragging a microphone along a jacket or something. Then we realized it was coming from the underwater comm system, because sometimes a dolphin chirp would cut it out. Suddenly the grumble turned into kind of a groan, like it changed inflection. Then we hear a loud whooshing sound. The groan got really loud, then nothing. Both the groan and more unnerving, the dolphins, were completely quiet. We checked our sensors right after, thinking maybe it was a contact, but you could tell the way the sound was traveling, by the bearing changes, that it was moving erratically. If we hadn't heard it, we would have written off the weird bearings as whales. We went active to try and see if maybe it was a sub and the bearing was something else, but we didn't see it again. That was definitely the weirdest one. As the witness slept in her apartment, she suddenly awoke, feeling a strange, oppressive atmosphere around her. She opened her eyes and saw a humanoid figure bending down over her. The figure was short, about 130 centimeter, and looked intently at the witness. 
The figure had a grayish-green pale facial complexion. It had large dark pupil, less eyes. Heavy skin folds covered the head and body of the creature. It had what appeared to be a thin beard and appeared to be elderly. A second humanoid now appeared next to the first one. This one was somewhat shorter and appeared younger. Both resembled aged gnomes. Both figures then floated back from the bed and vanished. At this point, what appeared to be a tennis ball-sized sphere of light appeared in their place. The sphere disappeared into the next room and then flew out an open window. I work at sea. Last month we came into dry dock to carry out refit and repairs. Dry dock is when a ship is brought into a lock. The gates closed and all the water pumped out, leaving the ship high and dry on the blocks, thus allowing repairs, inspections, etc. of the underside of the hull. Next to us was an old military frigate being broken down for scrap. She had arrived about two weeks prior to us. Once the frigate was on the box and dry, all of the crew left the old girl to her fate. A sad sight, but that's how these things go. Once all the sensitive stuff had been removed, the dock workers were free to go on. The dock foreman, John, went on board first with a camera to take pictures of work areas. He took a couple of hundred all in all. This was one of them. He later sent all of the pics to his boss, who upon seeing this one called John straight away, asking who is the guy with the axe at the edge of the camera flash. John had no idea. He never saw anyone. The area where this picture was taken was in a cross alleyway deep inside the ship. He was going around with a torch in a camera. When he'd go to take a picture, he would turn off the torch, leaving him in total darkness. Snap the shot, turn the torch back on, and be on his way. Due to the fact that it was a military vessel, the police were called. A search was carried out, but no one was found. There was one way on and off the ship, and that was by a gangway covered by CCTV. You couldn't jump over the side as it was a 25-meter drop onto concrete. No one was seen to leave the ship after John had taken a photo. I am a skeptic. Maybe it's a trick of the flash reflecting off something. But if you really zoom in, you can just make out the F.S. face, ear, collar of his jacket, and the axe in a meaty fist. Now it could be John blowing smoke up my ass. But when he was telling the story, he seemed genuinely rattled. And the guy in the pick looks nothing any of the other workers we met at the dock. If someone who was handy with cleaning up pictures, I'd be really interested to see what you can pull out of it. And before anyone asks, I'm not going to name the ship or even where she is, as I'm not sure if I'm supposed to have a picture of the innards of a military vessel. This gave me serious goosebumps. Needless to say, I did not go on board for a look. Diva Trent had fallen asleep when she awoke to a buzzing sound. Opening her eyes, she was horrified to find two strange creatures standing on either side of her bed. The entity to her right was about seven, eight feet tall, weighed about 300 pounds, had apparently no clothing and seemed to have either crocodile or snake-type skin. The creature to her left was identical in appearance, but smaller in height and weight. They seemed to be communicating in a chirping manner. Each of the entity's eyes glowed. Eva quickly discovered that she was unable to move. As she stared at the two creatures, she found that either one or both were giving her instructions telepathically. The nature of this was seemingly for her to create mentally visual scenes of various kinds, and then they proceeded to distort that particular pleasant scene in a perverse manner. Apparently, the creatures were intent not only to observe her emotional reaction, but also possibly to feed off the energy that was produced. After a while, Eva began to mentally resist the mind manipulation and began to pray earnestly. A short time later, she fell back to sleep. The next morning, the witness found five of her music tapes grossly distorted as if extreme heat had been applied. However, no evidence of fire or odor was present.
I was 11 years old, and it was the first time I was home alone late at night. And obviously, like all great scary movies, it was thunder and lightning out on this specific night. So I'm sitting in my living room watching TV, trying to pretend like I'm not terrified. Ignoring the lightning and thunder when I hear it for the first time, a bang on my front door. It's loud and immediately my heart stops. I try to ignore it and go back to watching TV when again another bang. At this point, I'm shedding my pants. I don't know what to do. I'm 11 years old, no cell phone to call anyone, and if I get up to use the landline, I have to walk right past the front door. This goes on for literally like an hour, just loud bangs on my front door. Sometimes, just one, sometimes a couple in a row. Finally, I'm like of it. I'm making a beeline for the phone and calling my pap, seeing when he's gonna be home. I sprint past my door and hopes whoever the murderer at my front door is. Won't some home see me cross the hallway ten feet in front of him and dial my dad? Tell him what's happening, so he comes home right then and there. I sit in fear, frozen next to the phone for until he gets home. He finally comes home and lets me know the reason I've been shaking in fear for the past hour. It is cause I forgot to close the screen door and it's been swinging in the wind off the house back and forth. F me right. He still makes fun of me from time to time about it. When I was 16, around 20 years ago, damn I'm old. I was an angsty teen and my dad wanted to go camping with me to reconnect. He let me invite a couple of my friends, and we camped out in this groomed spot that was adjacent to a neighborhood. It wasn't a real camping spot, so to speak, more like a wooded area in a populated area that was carved out for recreational camping. I call it city slicker camping. Anyway, we made camp and had dinner. Later that night, an argument broke out between my two friends, and I took one of them, Nick, out with me on a walk to cool off. It was around midnight, and while we were in a relatively populated area, my friend brought along a replica gun as a form of protection. Being a replica, it couldn't really protect us, but we figured that if we ran into some unruly people, we could scare them off with it. Very stupid, I know. Well, during our walk, we somehow made it out of the camping area and made our way into the adjacent neighborhood. By this point, it was getting really late, and we had been walking for a good hour and a half. Earlier, we had passed by what looked to be an old elementary school when Nick started telling me ghost stories to freak me out. It worked. This went on for a little while until I got so freaked out I wanted to head back. Because I was a scared little girly boy, I demanded the gun from him, and we decided to head back. By this time, it was closing on 2 a.m., and we were passing by the elementary school again. Just a quick for your information, we were walking on a paved street. We decided against walking on the sidewalk because we were rebels and there was zero traffic out. Anyway, as we passed by the school again, we both heard a ringing sound. I had no idea was it was at first, but it was a little ways behind us. We both turned around at the same time but saw nothing. We were thoroughly spooked by this point and started walking really fast back to camp. We were still a good hour and a half away, so we had a long way to go. As we walked faster, we heard the ringing again, but it was much closer. Judging by the sound, I figured it was around 20 or 30 feet behind us. We both stopped in our tracks and looked at each other. It wasn't a planned move, but I think since we were so spooked already, we didn't want to just turn around. We had seen enough horror movies to know what happens when you just turn around after hearing a creepy sound. After making eye contact, we slowly turned our heads to look at whatever was making the ringing sound. We saw a little girl, not more than ten years old, riding around on a bike. She didn't look supernatural or anything. She looked real as any other little girl, but she was wearing a very thin dress and she was riding a bike around in circles. I had come to the conclusion that the ringing sound was from a bell on the bike. It was relatively cool out and I had a hard time staying warm, wearing a thick sweater and hat. 
This girl was in a pale dress, frilly, and was riding around on a bike at close to 2 a.m. Spooky as hell, but since she wasn't see-through or have glowing eyes, we kind of relaxed a bit. We both turned around and started walking again, but after a few seconds I heard the ringing sound again, but it was really close to us at this point. Like right behind us, I turned around very quickly to ask her one simple question. Why are you riding around at night following us? But no one was there. It was like as if she just vanished into thin air. Sounds corny as hell, but hey, that's what happened. I turned around, and from what my friend tells me, I was as white as a sheep. I guess he knew something was wrong, and he just started sprinting. I was already thinking the same thing, so I was right there with him. We made it back to camp in nearly half the time it took us to get out there in the first place. All the anger from the previous argument had subsided, and it was just us recounting our ghostly tale to my dad and buddy. Good times were had after that, but I will never forget that experience. I'm sure there is a logical reason behind what happened, but it's still fun to think about it, and on occasion it still creeps me out. I live in the middle of the nowhere, like get Google Maps up, zoom out four times before you see anything but green around my house. In the United Kingdom, my house is also over 300 years old and I have a couple things to share. I'm self-employed, so I, I spend most of my time alone out here while my mom, who I live with, the house is legally mine now. But I also grew up in it. Is it work? None of this is supernatural at all, just creepy country folk. So I'll start small. There are the old foundations of some stone houses up on the hill behind us, dug right into the rock, the same rock our house is made of. Incidentally, me and my childhood BFF used to hang out up there in what we imagined to be the basement of this long-gone house. All that's left are some eroded stone steps down and the indentation in the hillside of the basement or foundations. We didn't do anything, really, except sit and talk. We went up there every day for weeks one summer, and then one day we both get this very powerful sense of dread that we shouldn't be there. We both said in our own way that the fairies didn't want us there, huh? British kids? I know I, at least, could almost feel the force of someone's dislike for my presence shoving at me. And then suddenly, we're just running. I honestly remember very little. We were sitting there suddenly freaked out, and then hurling down the hillside across two fields over my garden gate, and inside the house, in what felt like seconds, but had to be minutes. I must have slipped at some point because I had sheep poop streaked all the way up my side, but I don't remember falling. LMAO, I'm 27 now, and I flat out won't go to that place. I'll go around it. I'll go near it, but I am not stepping foot in what I feel like or its boundaries. Never again. Two, we've had search helicopters hovering low all around us and over the wood for nights in a row, and have never been told what they're doing spotlights, the works, nothing on local news. Sometimes I can't help but feel like there is something going on there. Other times I think, nah, it'll just be training ops. I don't know. Seems like an intense training op, if so. And at 11 p.m., 2 a.m.? 3. Another time we went walking in the woods, as we often did when I was younger, and found a dirty mattress just lying there in the dirt. Thing is, this wood is not bordered by any roads at all, nor do any pass through it. To get a mattress deep into it like that, you'd have to park half a mile away from the tree line and drag it over at least two fields, including climbing the fences, and then up a hill through densely packed trees and brambles. No idea why someone would do that. I mean, I know getting laid is a big deal and all, but... There are other woodlands around here closer to the road. Often at night, something will land very heavily on our roof and scrabble and skitter across the tiles. Not like talon scraping, which we're used to, but the skittering of a four-legged mammal. It's loud enough to wake us both up and spook the cat badly. 
There's really no way for anything that doesn't have wings to be landing on our roof, though no trees overhanging at all. It'd be easy enough to climb the gutters, but this thing sounds like it's landing from a height. All I can think is that owls are dropping the feistier rats they catch on our roof by accident, but it seems like a stretch for that to happen so often. Can't comfortably explain it. Gives me the creeps. On nights after I've heard it, I'm always more reluctant to go outside after dark. Three, some sort of beetle or something has been eating my window frame. Like chunks of the wood are missing. I hear it start to click away at it at night. But when I open my shutter and try to spot the little bugger, there's nothing to be seen except the bite wounds on the wood. Four, we had a neighbor, three fields over, who was a big-time child psychiatrist in the 60s, but who, when she was at her conferences, used to leave her son outside alone in the car for six, seven hours at a time in all weathers. The pair of them both creeped me the F out. Well, he still does. She collected dolls like a classic horror movie weirdo and had UV-sensitive skin, so had to wear a raincoat elbow-length gloves, a sun hat, and shades in all weathers. Literally couldn't have been better nightmare fuel for a child. One time I cycled past her house and she was just standing full raincoat on her doorstep with her arms outstretched and her head down, face hidden by the hood of the coat, perfectly still. But in truth I think she was actually harmless, just a little weird. Her son, though turned out to be an S-offender if you know what I mean, Five young victims that we know of after his mum died, and he still lives in her house two fields over. Sure does feel safe. Five, a little girl walked up and down the nearest road calling for her daddy. Not distressed, just like a bored kid who was being kept waiting. But I have no idea who she was. Nobody around here has children or grandchildren. Went to find the closest neighbor's number so I could alert them, and she was gone by the time I'd finished speaking to them. Five, guy closest to us, one field over, has had his hunting dogs taken off him by the RSPCA three times. He keeps them in a tiny sheet, metal shack with no outdoor access except once a week or less. When he takes them hunting, he keeps managing to get more despite the court order and you can very often hear him screaming at them and them yelping. To end on a light note, I have really disturbed sleeping habits so tend to work from 7 p.m. 5 a.m. most days and will usually still be awake until 6, 7 a.m. One such morning in October last year, there's a very heavy frost, a light mist. It's just early enough for the birds to still be quiet in the trees. I'm riding upstairs, and I hear this long, low, guttural bellow. Nothing like a cow. All I can describe it as is it sounded like the sound effects they use for dinosaur noises in Jurassic Park. Silence. And then another bellow, this one louder and longer. I'm quietly freaking the F out because in 26 years in the countryside, I know my animal noises, and I've never heard anything like this. For a surreal moment, my brain just can't fit that noise into any sensible form of reality. And I actually, seriously, honestly believe some sort of time. Slip dinosaur or F, a stranded alien, is injured or dying in our field. The bellowing sounds again, this time ending in a high-pitched wail, even more like a movie dinosaur than before. I carefully make my way downstairs and outside into the garden, which would definitely get me killed in any horror movie. It's what I was thinking. I tiptoe in the direction of the noise. Now a series of low, throaty rumbles, rather like a bear, totally ready to find myself at the center of a major world event, or else a major government cover-up. And I see. The stag. It was a stag. His harem had strayed, and he wasn't happy about it. It was a stag. I feel certain that most Americans would have already guessed that. But man, in the United Kingdom, to see deer in the wild is honestly very rare outside of certain limited locations. They're the only deer I've ever seen around here, let alone her. And he was amazing. 
like I'd only ever seen stags like that on postcards and in documentaries. Breath steaming in the cold, huge rack of antlers, head tipped back all the way, and just yelling at the sky. As though a deer, a female deer, has turned out to be around the back of my house, hence him aiming all of his unearthly bellows in our direction. And I just stand and watch, stunned as the three of them bounce over the fence and rejoin them, and they all just melt into the tree line. I'm 31 years old and from central Pennsylvania, but this story takes place back in September of 2008 when I lived in Ohio. At that time, my best friend Sierra and I went to a state park named Hocking Hills Inn for a day retreat from our busy lives. We had decided on this at random when we first got together early in the morning just after sunrise. It was a nice warm late summer day, and we just got the wild notion to go for a drive to Hocking Hills, since the area is well known for its several walking trails, a cave or two, and several waterfalls, and running water creek areas. The day was very warm, maybe roughly 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius, so we had worn shorts and short-sleeved t-shirts. We started down a trail at random and found that part of the trail had been washed out, so we had to take another path, which, according to our phone's GPS tool, would force us to cross a small country road. As we played with our mobile phones and noted it was roughly 12 noon EST, we happened to be passed by a group of seemingly odd backpackers before we reached the road, and one of the people gripped my shoulder and turned me around to warn us to be aware of a wash out up ahead if we were going to. Take the trail into the woods instead, the person who stopped us, let go of my shoulder and recommended we follow the trail nearby, which would go next to the forest fire. Look out tower instead as it bit past a small clump of downed brush. As we crossed the road to the tower trail, we noticed there was caution tape all over the fire tower. There was a pungent smell in the air which we could not identify. The windows on top of the tower appeared to be taped up grimy and there were flies all over the area. We walked past it, commenting on how odd it was and continued down the trail we had been recommending to take, but it was one neither of us had noticed before on a previous walk to the area. This trail took us past the fire tower and then cut into the woodlands. As we walked into the forest, maybe 1,500 feet or 457 meters or so, we took notice that no one seemed to be around, and in fact not only did we feel isolated from others, but we felt very chilled without explanation. Sierra pointed it out verbally while I was thinking it, but we just continued walking. Eventually the air started to get noticeably chillier and damper. This did not seem unusual at first, but as we continued to walk, the air seemed to go from warm to what felt like the mid-fifties Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius, and we started to shiver. It was also getting darker as we continued forward. At first, I thought it was just due to the green leaves on the trees and maybe a passing cloud overhead, but the darkness really did not improve as one expected. As we walked, we looked around and there was nothing but trees on all sides. There should have been a forest edge somewhere, as the area wasn't really that big, but aside from some hills and tall pine trees, there wasn't a real ending to the woods like we expected, as the area tends to be narrow, and normally you can see the edges. My friend took out her phone to use her GPS, because she instinctively felt lost, but her battery was nearly gone. I took mine out of my back pocket, and it had no signal. The battery was also near dead and showed he, uh, for the time, meaning it couldn't update as it was an older style flip phone, with a camera and when set to auto adjust would contact the mobile phone network every 15 minutes. It was only then, as the light grew dimmer, that I noticed the area seemed very silent, our footsteps, the leaves we stepped on, grass, twigs, and our breathing just echoed. Sierra got spooked, and I did too. She mentioned it was very out of the ordinary, and I agreed, but I couldn't shake this sense of foreboding that something was amiss. I tried to rationalize it, 
but I really, honestly, couldn't figure any of it out at all. We just pressed onwards, and after going down a small hill and back up, it seemed to have gotten a lot darker. The world seemed to have gone from just shadowy to near, twilight darkness. My friend grabbed my arm and started freaking out about how weird it got. Then the air seemed to have gone still, and we had a feeling of something wrong. We both took off running, looking for an exit. For some odd reason, we never thought to turn around at all and just got back the way we came. It never seemed to occur to us as we ran, but the spookiness continued as we could hear our steps echo off the area, as things just felt like they grew more gloomy. Then ahead of us, down another small dip in the trail, we could see two large honeysuckle bushes on either side of the trail like a gate. We made a mad dash, mostly where they're pulling me, for these bushes, and just as we pushed through the plants, something odd happened. We were overwhelmed by a change in our surroundings as light, sound, and warmth returned all at once. It was like stepping outside of a cold, empty, and dark building onto a warm, busy street. We stood at the edge of a place known as Ash Cave, which has a large waterfall not too far away, with a U-shaped cliff. I turned around to look back from where we emerged, and while the bushes were the same, the area was so different, brighter, not silent for sure, and warm. In fact, our skin was cold to touch, which just reinforced the facts. We took out our phones, and the time had finally updated. It was now 4 p.m. The normal trail would only have taken an hour to walk fully, so it was a loss of three full hours. Logic attempted to set in, and we decided the trail we came up with must have just appeared creepy, because there may have been clouds overhead or a storm blew by, but when we went back between the bushes, there was no trail. Nothing looked like it had a few seconds ago. Sierra walked around the bushes twice, and it was the same bright, sunny day with no darkness and no trail. We waited. It was blue sky overhead, and we could see the edges of the forest and other people. The trail had simply vanished as if we had never walked it. On returning to the normal trail with the washout, we ended up locating an offshoot path which took us back past the fire tower. It was here we noticed it was normal looking as the windows were not taped and very clean, and there was no pungent smell. We don't know what it was, but it certainly was creepy. Of course, I jokingly told her later that day over dinner we had entered the fairy realms by mistake and were lucky to get away. She didn't find that funny, of course, but either way, we both felt we should share this with you. And if anyone out there has had a similar experience, perhaps they can provide insight or share their own. I'm Chris, a park ranger, and have 11 years on my belt. Also, experience comes with stories, many of which are ghost or paranormal stories. This story is true. Not going to say where I work, but it is a very large park. This story took place spring of 2008. The park that I worked at had a very big drinking problem with youths trespassing all the time. We had calls almost every night. I worked nights most of my career. One day, a member of the public who were camping had called in saying that there were a large group of youths making noise and drinking. I was dispatched and starting walking over in the dark. I tried to sneak up. This was a breach of my standard operating procedure. To try to apprehend as many as I can, I managed to apprehend four. Five don't clearly remember. And all the others ran into the woods. My prediction was that were as many as 20. People from what I saw. I radioed through to dispatch to get a couple of deputies out here to take over. Deputies arrived at this point. I was all alone in the middle of nowhere. I radioed through to try to get guided back to the more civilized part of the woods. At this point, I had already walked quite far, and radio connection was breaking up. We had bad radios back then. As I approached a part of the woods I was similar with, a I looked behind me and saw someone walking up to me very slowly. I then called out, Hello. No response at this point. Radio contact was back. I radioed in saying that I have spotted someone. At this point, the figure is maybe 40 meters away. 
I then called out, stop, and are you okay, no response. As the figure came closer, it just disappeared. I couldn't make out what it was. Next day came a normal day, mentioned to my friend who had worked here for ten years. I mentioned what happened, and he made a scared face and said it's nothing got up and walked away. In 2013, I left to work at the sheriff's office, never mentioned to anyone except some close friends while drunk. This might not be the scariest story, but I have only had a couple of other ghost stories, might put them on here later on. But this sends shivers down my spine as it is still unexplained, which makes the story even scarier. But I hope this interested some of you guys. I will submit more in the future. I have tried to contact some people that have worked in similar settings to see if they have similar experience, and by the looks of it, not many people have had similar experience except some guys in search and rescue and border patrol. Also, I have read some stories of stuff like this in the UK. I might update if I have seen a similar story. I am a park ranger named John and was driving down a remote road deep within the forest. I reached a point where the Mullica River ran parallel to the road. Up ahead, my headlights illuminated a large dark figure emerging from the woods and making its way onto the roadway. Approaching cautiously, I saw the figure step right in front of my car, blocking my path. I had to bring my vehicle to a sudden halt to avoid hitting this enigmatic creature. The creature before me was something out of the ordinary. It stood well over six feet tall, its body covered in wet, matted black fur. Strangely, it appeared to lack four legs, but boasted a pair of massive, powerful hind legs. As I sat there, the creature's two piercing red eyes locked onto me through the car's windshield. It lingered for a few tense moments before abruptly turning and continuing its journey across the road, walking upright with a peculiar, almost robotic, with a peculiar, almost robotic, like gait, eerily reminiscent of a human. Was this a dogman? I lived in Mexico. It's a decent part of Mexico, close to the border, minimal crime, and it's silent 99% of the time. The issue is that my family couldn't afford a telephone, and the nearest hospital was across the border. We were near the beach, so the rain would get pretty wicked. My grandmother always told us to run inside when it rained or the owls would get you. She then proceeded to lock the steel gate in the solid wood door with four different locks. One day I asked what were the owls. She simply went stone-faced. I have never seen anything but a nice smile or the lip quiver of worry from her. So as a kid, my heart sank. She didn't give me an answer. Later that week, a storm hit, and I played out by the sea. She said, hurry. The owls will make you weak to the ocean and take you away. I, being a punk that I was, stayed and splashed some more. She simply started walking away. I freaked out and followed. She was old, so she couldn't run. But even I had trouble keeping up. The rain hit us, and she locked the doors and prayed. I'm sorry. Later that night, as we were walking upstairs, and I saw something that warped what I thought was normal. Two shadows on the walls, one short and stubby and one long and scrawny, no bigger than a child. Their size didn't make sense. They had such. Small, twisted figures, and the worst part, I couldn't see them. I couldn't see them. I could only witness their shadows. I couldn't tell if they were inside or had been locked out. I instinctively held my grandmother's hand and stared to where I thought they were. My grandma moved my head, so I looked forwards. The more you see, the more they see you. I slept in her bed that night. To this day, I still see twisted shadow figures. Less often, sure, but others can see them, too. They simply look past the shadows and pass it off as an illusion. I can't be in the ocean for more than 13 minutes without my body weakening. I tried to prove it to some friends and they had to carry me out of the water because I couldn't support my own weight. You can choose to believe me or not, but that secluded part of Mexico 
It was the scariest place I ever visited. I have seen a dogman multiple times. The first time was when I was a child growing up in Alabama. My brother and I both saw it. It was about six feet tall, standing on its back legs, and had a face like a wolf, dark fur and reddish eyes. Saw it multiple times that summer, but never as close. A few years later, I saw it peering into my window while I was trying to fall asleep. My parents never believed me, of course, but I insisted on changing rooms and always kept the blind shut. The last time I saw one was when I was about 22 hiking with a group of friends. We were about four miles from the trailhead and I needed to take a piss. They kept hiking as I'm generally faster than them and knew I would catch up. When I was done with my business and turned around, I saw the same head peeking from behind a tree. Camping in the Sierra Nevadas a few weeks back when that wildfire was going on up at Wishing, wake up at 2 a.m. for no reason, lay my head back down and close my eyes until I hear blood-curdling screams echoing through the hills. I'm talking like the kind of sound that you never want to hear come from a human, kind of high-pitched and lots of fluctuation in it. Like how your own voice cracks when you're yelling as loud and as hard as you can. This went on for like a minute and a half, two minutes, somewhere in there. So at the time, I'm thinking that I'm hearing someone being attacked by a bear or something. But I was probably just hyping myself up over what was more than likely a fox or a big cat. But still, that was creepy as hell. Oh yeah. And that same night, before going to bed, I heard twigs being stepped on just outside of her campsite, maybe 20 yards out in the woods. I kept listening, and when it didn't stop, I grabbed a flashlight and waved it through the trees, and I could have sworn that I saw something duck behind a tree. But I'm willing to admit that this was more than likely my mind playing tricks on me. I live out pretty far north in Canada, British Columbia. I lived in a place called Prince Rupert for a few years, small population of 5,000 and very wooded also right by the ocean. I was DD for my friends a few years back and we were driving along the highway around midnight. The part of the highway we were on was very wooded. Now I was sober since I was the driver. I noticed a figure off the side of the road. It kind of looked like a bear, but very large, even for a grizzly. As we approached this creature, stood on its hind legs and looked at us approaching. It ran a few steps along the side of the road, then went into the thick forest. My hair was standing on end, and I had goosebumps everywhere, absolutely shocked. Now my friends were no shape to collaborate what I saw, but I believe I saw Bigfoot. I was standing next to the recreation center on Thetis Lake with my friend Gordon P. When we saw it, a scaly creature emerging from the lake and moving onto the shoreline. The sight was terrifying, just as we had described to others. The creature had a roughly triangular shape with dark, bulging, fish-like eyes and a mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth. A spike protruded from the top of its head, adding to its menacing appearance. We estimated its weight to be around 120 pounds, standing at about 5 feet tall and 5 feet wide. Overwhelmed by fear, we quickly turned and ran for our lives. With its webbed extremities propelling it forward, the creature pursued us relentlessly until we were a safe distance from the lake. Unfortunately, it managed to catch up with Gordon, causing a deep gash on his hand with its sharp pointed head. Still trembling with terror from our encounter with the monstrous amphibian, we hurriedly made our way to the nearest Royal Canadian Mountain Police Station. We recounted the incident to the officers, showing them the cut on Gordon's hand that was inflicted by the creature's razor-sharp fin. The authorities recognized the sincerity in our story and immediately initiated a search. More like a monster hunt in Thetis Lake, 
However, despite their efforts, no trace of the creature was found during the investigation. The case was nearly dismissed until four days later, on August 23 of the same year, at approximately 3.30 in the afternoon. Russell Van Nice and Mike Gold came forward with their own sighting of the creature from the opposite side of Theta's Lake. Unlike our encounter where we were pursued, this time the creature simply emerged from the lake, glanced around, and submerged itself back into the water. Van Nees and Gold described the creature's face as resembling that of a monster with a humanoid body standing at least five feet tall. Its skin was silver-colored and covered in scales, while a sharp point jutted out from its heels, while a sharp point jutted out from its head. The creature's ears were unusually large, and its eyes sent shivers down their spines with their horrifying appearance. I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, and my story is from there. A couple of years ago, I was going to art school, and I had a part-time job at a grocery store. Part of our art lessons was to go out into various parts of Victoria and draw buildings and such things like that. So one field trip we had, we went to a grave site and we started drawing tombstones and stuff. I remember I sat down and I started drawing this tombstone and there was a lady's name on there. Anyway, uh, I started drawing it. A couple weeks later, I'm working at the grocery store and I'm pretty much the only one there. It's a really small grocery store, and I'm sitting there with another cashier, and in walks this lady, and I can't see her because I have my back to the door, but the other cashier that I was working with, we were talking blah, 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 and she looks at me like she was so freaked out. So I turn around, and I look, and I see this weird-looking lady with this long black dress on. I'm totally not lying. She was wearing this long black dress, long scraggly hair, gross-looking skin, like gray, grayish tone, and I'm northern, so I can tell people's skin tones. Anyway, she freaked me out so much, like that was not what regular people look like, so I screamed and ran away. That was like my first instinct, to just scream and run away. I couldn't believe it. Once I realized that I had screamed and ran away from this lady, I just realized I'm supposed to help. I went back, composed myself, and I said, Can I help you? She said, I don't know where I am, like in this really creepy voice. So I was so freaked out by this lady, I looked at her. I was really close, and her eyes just looked like they were held up with toothpicks, like it was just bugging out of her face. So I said, You don't know where you are. Let me call you a cab. So I said, what's your name? She said, it's Elizabeth. And just a couple weeks earlier, when I was drawing this tombstone, I remember what the name of that lady was. And this fresh pile of dirt over there, and it looked like a fairly fresh grave, and the name was Elizabeth. I was so freaked out by this lady. I mean, she did not look like she was walking. It looked like she is floating. She had no footsteps at all. It shook me up so much. It's been like five years, and I still get creeped out when I think about her. I don't know if I'd just seen that parallel between the living and the dead, but that person that I saw that hovered at me was not human. As a long-haul trucker, I've encountered my fair share of unusual and eerie situations on the road. One incident that still sends shivers down my spine happened around six years ago when I was driving along with a friend. We found ourselves on a desolate mountain road, far from civilization. Little did we know, this journey would introduce us to a chilling encounter that would forever haunt our memories. As we cruised along the winding road, engrossed in our conversation, my friend suddenly interrupted with an urgent tone in his voice. He told me to pay attention to the truck driver who had just passed us, gesturing wildly as if warning us not to stop. Intrigued by his urgency, I turned my gaze in the direction he pointed, catching a glimpse of the truck disappearing into the distance. Curiosity peaked. I kept my eyes peeled, searching for any signs of danger or unusual activity. And then it happened. 
A few moments later, I noticed a figure on the side of the road. It appeared to be a woman, hunched over something, her silhouette barely visible in the darkness. The image was fleeting as we were quickly approaching a bend, making it difficult to discern any details. My friend, however, had a clearer view and immediately relayed his observations. He insisted that the woman was eating something from the ground, possibly roadkill. The thought alone was enough to send a shiver down my spine. But what disturbed my friend even more was when the woman turned to look at us as we passed by. The chill that crept up my spine intensified and intensified in a sense of unease settled over us. The whole situation seemed inexplicably unsettling, leaving us with more questions than answers. Who was this woman? What was she doing in the middle of nowhere, feasting on something on the roadside? And why did the truck driver feel compelled to warn us as we continued our journey? The image of the mysterious woman stayed etched in our minds, lingering like a haunting presence. About ten years ago, my family and I were doing some fishing, four-wheeling in the back country of Colorado. This R is well out of cell phone range, and we have been here multiple times before. We usually split up into groups of two, one kid with each parent. We each have a small walkie-talkie to communicate with the other group. My mom and I got out of the jeep and proceed to start fishing in the creek, and not three minutes later, we get a bear and bear cub by the river. We are coming back to pick you up over the radio, which is nothing new. We see bears quite often. So my mom and I hightail it back to the road and hop in the jeep. We drive a few miles up river before we decide to head out again and fish. Well, we have our full day of fishing and start to head out of the area, and on the way out, about two or three feet off of the road, is an aspen tree stump that had been chained, sawed of at some point. Standing on the stump was the bear cub, just hanging out, playing on its own. We don't see Mama Bear, so we decide to drive by it. Even if we did see her, we would just take off down the road. So I have a disposable camera, and we stop for a quick moment to take a few pictures of it. I am literally close enough to touch it. We all stare in amazement because we have never seen a bear cub this close. So naturally, we develop the pictures. The pictures have the background, the tree stump, the road, everything in perfect focus, but no bear. Everyone in my family saw the bear, and we have no idea what happened. We all refer to it as the ghost bear. I lived with my grandparents and my mother. Grandparents were out of town on a trip, and my mom had left for work an hour prior at 11 p.m. She works graveyard shifts. This was not the first time I'd stayed at home alone, but it wasn't a regular thing. You'd think I would have fun with it and make whatever food I want, browse online without being watched, watch whatever on TV, and live the dream as a kid with freedom. I'm the opposite. On high alert, watching Disney Channel with the phone next to me. Eventually, I start to relax and get up to walk to the kitchen. Something is off. My basement door is always shut to avoid cold air coming into the main floor, and it's cracked. Me being me, a panic and freeze in my tracks. I keep staring at it and see it move back and forth for a few seconds and see it slam shut. I freak the fout and run to get my flats and shoot out the front door. With my keys in the middle of winter, snow falling, and it's fairly windy, I ran full speed down the street and around the corner to a family friend's house. I bang on the door, and they answer and ask if someone chasing me, and I said I don't know, but I think someone's in my house. I'm beyond terrified, so I called my mom from their phone and explained what happened while crying and struggling to breathe. I stayed over there that night, and my mom picked me up when she got off work at around 7 in the morning. We go back to the house and investigate. Nothing weird when we open the door to go downstairs, but at the end of the stairs there's a water trail on the floor. Leads to the back door to outside, and it's cracked open. It's unlocked, but it can't be unlocked from the outside because it's a sliding latch, and it didn't seem forced or broken, so it must have been left open. 
There's footprints outside the door that are kind of covered from fresh snow, but you can tell someone was there and broke in. My mom didn't call the cops, although I wish she would have, but she's not one to look into things. I could break my wrist and she'd tell me to ice it and move on. Anyway, we called my grandparents and told them what happened. They were worried and glad I was okay. When they got back, my grandpa installed a nice deadbolt on the door. I'm 20 now and I'm still scared in my own apartment at night, but I made sure to get a place with nice security and made friends with the neighbors in case of emergencies. First story is about me heading to my middle school bus stop. I lived about three, four small blocks away from my stop in a small town. I had loads of energy when I was younger, so I would get up at 5.30 a.m. to get ready for school, and once I was finished, I would just head to the bus stop to hang out. It's still pretty dark outside once I start walking 6.30-ish, and since it's a quiet town, I was never really scared to walk in the dark. One morning I was on my way there, just minding my business, probably following cracks on the sidewalk, and I hear grunting, fast-paced primal grunting. I looked around for a second and made eye contact with one of the homeless men in the area, and he charged after me. I was probably four feet eleven, tiny girl with a ponytail running to my bus stop, which is marked as someone's house, and hid inside one of the bushes. It was still dark but I could make out a body walking around slowly as if he was searching for me. After a few minutes he leaves and I knock on the house's door and tell the owner what happened and he lets me stay inside. Neighborhood watch homes or bus stops for kids, so I was fine. Until other kids get there. Told my mom wasn't allowed to walk there alone for months. I worked in a gun shop in Houston. One day, this guy comes in and asks what is the process to buy a gun if he is not a U.S. citizen. We had to call the BATF to find out. He was a ship captain with a Panamanian passport. He needed a pistol. He had to get a letter from the Panamanian consulate and some export paperwork before he could buy it. We asked him why he would go through all this trouble. Turns out, in the middle of the Atlantic, one of the crewmen woke up the cook and asked him to make some coffee. The cook took offense and chased the guy down and cut off his arm with a machete. The cook would be on the ship on the return trip. On the evening of July 11, 2023, I walked outside my house to investigate why my neighbor's dog was wildly barking. I live in a small town in northern Minnesota. I went through the door at the side of my house that is also connected to the garage. Anyways, while I was standing by the side of my house wondering what the dog was barking at, I looked to my right, where there was a small, empty lot full of grass and bushes, and I saw something about the size of a Great Dane with large pitch black eyes looking at me. It was light brown had long fur and was standing in the grass about 30 yards from me. I think its face was like a monkey. Actually, it reminded me of a baboon, but there is no way that is what it was. Anyways, I'm almost 100% sure it wasn't a dog, cat, or anything else. I screamed so loud that my neighbors ran out and started to look for whatever it was. My neighbors grabbed his rifle and walked into the lot. After several minutes, he returned and said that whatever it was growled at him, but it was hidden in the bushes. He said the growl was unlike anything that he had ever heard before. He is a hunter and is very familiar with the local wildlife. Whatever it was could be heard running off. I called the local police and reported the sighting. Has anyone else reported anything like this? I need answers. I'm fearful that it may come back. I often find myself pondering about something or someone I encountered during one of my drives through the desert on the road to Ajo. Each year, my friends and I would make a trip to Puerto Penasco, Mexico, to indulge in fishing and revel in the beauty of the Sea of Cortez. To avoid the scorching heat, 
We would depart from Colorado's San Luis Valley around 3 p.m., embarking on our journey to Ajo in the early hours of the morning. Around 3 a.m., it was during one of these trips that an intriguing incident unfolded. On that particular night, I was behind the wheel of a rental car while my companions dozed off. Suddenly, I was passed by a naked man sprinting in the opposite lane of the road. He moved with remarkable speed, barefoot, and seemingly determined. Startled, I hit the brakes and checked my rearview mirror, half expecting to offer assistance. To my surprise, the man swiftly disappeared into the desert, vanishing from sight. As I continued my drive, I kept a vigilant eye out for any signs of a stranded car or someone in need, but the road remained deserted. The incident left me unsettled, leaving me with a lingering sense of unease. The following year, in the same vicinity, at around the same time of night, I found myself dozing in the back seat of the car. Briefly roused from my slumber, I glanced out of the window and beheld a striking sight. In a ditch alongside the highway, I spotted an intricately carved large stone dog, reminiscent of the stone carvings found in Chinese art. The sight triggered a thought in my mind, suggesting a connection to skinwalkers. Though I couldn't be certain, these experiences continued to intrigue me, leaving me with an enduring sense of wonder and a desire to unravel the mysteries of the desert. I want to share a weird experience my husband and I had. It happened about a year and a half ago. San Bernardino County has a place we visit in the mountains. We gather medicine or we gather some things for homo purposes. On the road where we intend to do this, the layout of the land is significant, so let me explain it to you briefly. It's a wide open road and a dead end on one side. You can see in either direction from the hill. You take a dirt road to a T-shaped. We walk up this dirt path, up the hill, to where we need to collect the stuff. We were up there picking stuff, and my husband and the dog were on one side, and I was on the other side. So my bag becomes full. I proceed down the dirt road to where our van is parked on the main street. And just before I get there, mind you, you can see in either direction. A car appears out of nowhere right behind our van and its uh, red car. There are no distinguishing logos or anything. i never seen a car like it, but it's rather sporty looking. As a result, the car appears out of nowhere, spins around and circles around the van. I get nervous. I walk up the hill with my husband. He comes back down to me and this man gets out of the car and honks, 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 and he starts walking up the hill. I got a very odd feeling. It was really odd. My husband and I go back down the hill towards the van and he disappears. Gone, both of us were right there. Both of us were right there. The car, the man, everything gone. There was nothing in front of our eyes. My husband was there too. When I was a little kid, we lived in the country on top of a hill about 15 miles of dirt road. It's about seven miles going up once at the top. There is a valley with a nice clearing for about half a mile. One year around dusk, we heard airplanes, big ones and a lot of them. So of course we all go outside to see what's going on. It was literally raining men. Apparently the army was using our hill for training. At some point, my dad put us on our roof so we could all get a really good view. It was so cool. Someone came and asked everyone on the hill to turn off our lights. Only about six houses because it was causing the men to jump earlier or go off point. Many landed in trees and you could the hurt ones yelling and one guy landed just across our road in the power lines. My dad had to go stay with him until someone could turn the power off so they could cut him down. He was freaked out about anything touching him. Understandable. For the next week, we would see these men roaming the hills, and every once in a while, one would ask for water. Of course, being neighborly as country folk, or they always got a meal. I don't think they were supposed to make contact with us, but a few would.
I was wondering if I should share this random spooky moment that happened around ten years ago with my now ex-girlfriend. I'm also open to shared psychosis, if that's how that works, because we both heard from the living room the sound of plastic bag being either rubbed with itself or with another bag in my room. It was very clear, crisp, not loud enough to be a jump scare, but enough for us to hear it. We thought it was a bag that could have been blowing around in my room from the ack or something, but it was spookier after investigating and finding nothing. We looked at each other like there's no way there's not a plastic bag in here. What made that sound? These days I don't care. I still sleep in this room without her, so am I the plastic bag. A little background. We were both into horror movies and spooky stories, scenarios, and would even sometimes accidentally scare each other. Walking around the house, she was fun, but she wasn't a trickster. Even if there was a third party, say another trickster or even ghost causing the fuss, they'd still have to produce a plastic bag. My ex and I were going camping, and I found a spot not far out of town. Since neither of us had been there before I accidentally drove past the campground and went down a logging road for a few miles. It was getting dark, and I realized we should turn back. I obviously missed it. So I stopped the car and do one of those six-point turns in the middle of the dirt road. On our left is a steep hill going down. On the right, it's a hill going up with tree stumps and some bushes. Well, as I'm turning around on the hill going up, we both see a naked, very huge dude with a smaller person on his back. They were just standing there in the bushes, and when they noticed us, started stampeding down the hill toward us. Both of us freaking out, and I finally complete the turnaround and speed the fuck out to there. We went straight back into town, about 20 miles away. We didn't go camping that night. To this day, I would have thought I imagined it. I could not tell if it was an actual person, and my girlfriend confirmed she seen the same thing. Second weirdest thing to happen to me in my life. It's crazy how your brain just dismisses things it can't explain. If my girlfriend was not there, I would have forgotten it happened. I'm a recreational sailor with a 26-foot sloop, so I don't venture out on the high seas. I stay coastal. One night I decided to anchor up in this protected bay. It was summertime, and there was a good chance of overnight thunderstorms. So I carefully made my way through a pretty narrow channel that opens up some to a bayou that is protected well enough many people will stash their boat in there during hurricanes. Plus, it's usually a nice spot just to hang out. I got there late around 11 p.m., so I had to feel my way in through the dark. There was no moon, and even if there was, the cloud cover was thick enough it would have been blocked anyway, so it was slow going and a little disorienting. Once I reached the area that opens up a bit, I dropped anchor and prepped the boat in case a storm blew up. I made sure the halyards wouldn't bang around, secured the sails, stuff like that. Then I made my dinner and hopped in the forward berth with a book. Now you get used to odd noises. Boats have a way of occasionally creaking and clanging a bit. It's a part of their soul. Quite often you will hear a porpoise blow nearby. But this night really scared me for a bit. First, the wind picked up. A lot. The air rushing by my rigging began to make it vibrate so that it was making a high-pitching humming noise. That's not scary, but it kept me awake. And since it was the standing rigging, there wasn't anything I could do about it. So I'm lying there, wide awake in the dark, listening to this hum noise. I'm not freaked out, but it's a very mournful noise. A short while later, as I'm huddled in my bunk, I feel the bulkhead flex next to me at the same time. I hear a very loud thud, followed by a splash. What the, uh, I f so I race out on deck with my flashlight and work my way up to the bow. It's windy, so at first I thought maybe the boat was swinging on anchor and it hit a piling or something. I inspect the area and don't see anything I could have hit. So I grabbed my spotlight and used it to look underwater as best I could. I didn't see anything submerged either. 
Okay, so I'm thinking it was a dolphin or perhaps an alligator. The lightning is starting to pick up in the distance. It's still windy, and despite the fact it's summer, I'm getting chilled just standing around on deck in my skivvies. So I climb back below and try to get rest. About ten minutes later, once again, thud. Again, I go back up on deck and investigate. And again, aside from annoying a pelican who was perched on a piling about thirty yards away, I find nothing. I go back to bed. Several minutes later, thud. Splash. This went on for about two hours. I didn't sleep well that night. The next morning, before I set sail, I thoroughly searched the area. I was anchored on a soft mud bottom and never did find the piling or submerged stump or anything that I would have hit. To this day, I have no idea what it was, but it was a very freaky night for me. I still think it might have been some manner of animal, but why on earth it kept coming back over the course of two hours is beyond me. I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was on duty, stationed in the Navy, keeping watch over the vast expanse of the ocean. It was a calm day, with the sun shining brightly in a gentle breeze sweeping across the deck. Little did I know that what I was about to witness would forever shake my belief in reality. As I scanned the horizon, my eyes caught something unusual in the distance. A warship, seemingly from the World War II era, caught my attention. It was positioned at a near ice distance by naval standards, and what caught me off guard was the fact that it was staying perfectly still. It almost looked like a ghostly apparition suspended in time. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't tear my gaze away. Suddenly, without any warning, the warship's guns started firing. I braced myself for the deafening roar that should have followed, but to my utter bewilderment there was no sound. The guns fired, and yet it was as if I had suddenly lost my sense of hearing. It was eerie and unnerving. I couldn't fathom how a warship firing its guns, even at a distance, could be so silent. The experience sent shivers down my spine, and I felt a chill creeping up my back. It was like witnessing a surreal scene straight out of a sci-fi movie. In my state of shock, I decided to call over a fellow mate to witness this bizarre phenomenon. I needed confirmation that I wasn't losing my mind or succumbing to some strange illusion. As he approached, I pointed out the ghostly warship, and his eyes widened in astonishment. What in the world is that? He whispered, barely able to find his voice. I have no idea, I replied, my voice tinged with disbelief. We both stood there, side by side, watching the inexplicable sight unfold before us. The warship remained in its stationary position, firing its gun silently into the distance. We exchanged glances, trying to make sense of the impossible. Neither of us could explain what we were seeing. It was as if we had stumbled upon some otherworldly time warp or a holographic projection from the past. It defied all rational explanations leaving us bewildered and filled with an uneasy feeling. Eventually, the warship slowly faded away like a mirage dissipating in the heat. We were left standing there, staring at the empty expanse of the ocean, trying to process what we had just witnessed. Till this day, I still don't have a logical explanation for what happened that day. Some say it was a strange atmospheric phenomenon or an optical illusion. Others believe it was a glimpse into a parallel dimension. But for me and my mate, the memory of the silent Y warship will forever remain a haunting mystery, a reminder that there are things in this world, and perhaps beyond it, that defy our understanding and challenge the very fabric of reality. I was in Georgia around 10 p.m. and saw something way up in the atmosphere, tracking westward, trucking westward. Truck was parked at a warehouse, and I there to unload the next morning. Whatever I saw was bright, but way high and moving fast. I call my parents in Texas and tell them to look straight up and look to the easy for summer hawing moving west. They see nothing. We hang up. I look at this thing till it's out of my sight. About five minutes. 
Five more minutes pass, and my parents call telling me they see it. Could have been a satellite, maybe. But that would be the first time I or they saw one in their town, as there is too much city light for satellites to be seen. That was the first time I saw something in the sky that I could not explain. I-30, four female, was hanging out downstairs while my child, five male, years not months, slept upstairs in bed just like every night. I have a camera baby monitor that is closed circuit, does not even connect to the internet, basically only a camera and a handheld screen, doesn't hook up to a cell or anything. Anyway, last night I was sitting on the couch watching TV when I noticed my kiddo moving around. So I started watching the monitor to see if I needed to run up and lay with him before he fully awoke. Then it looked as if he was lifted an inch or so and tossed. So then I really watched the monitor thinking I didn't see what I thought I saw. Then it was like he got scooted up. Then it was like something had him by his upper arms and pulling him up into a sitting position with his head back. Like when you're trying to move someone that's sleeping and they are limp. I immediately ran upstairs and flipped the light on to find him sound asleep between the pillows covered in sweat. I called my husband in a panic because I was very freaked out and he told me that I probably didn't see it right or was imagining things and to not let it bother me. I could not get my heart rate and breathing to calm after about ten minutes of sitting in the bed next to my sleeping kid so I ended up scooping him up and branding him downstairs to sleep on the couch because I sure as hell wasn't going to sleep up there, and neither was he. My husband said it was stupid for me to do that, but I was very uncomfortable being upstairs. My son slept through everything, from being scooped up, carried downstairs, and being placed on the bed, as well as me staying up for several more hours, watching TV and not being able to sleep, and woke up when I got up for work this morning at 5 a.m. I don't even know what answers I'm looking for. I'm freaked out and terrified of what I saw. Today I had another scary experience. It was around 4.23 a.m. I woke up from my sleep and felt thirsty, so I drank some orange juice next to me and planned to go back to sleep. After a couple minutes of quietness, I felt sleepy and closed my eyes until I heard knocking on my window, which scared me. I felt fear when I heard it because my window is next to me. It's above me by seven inches. This was the second time I heard it since a month or two ago. I remember it so well because I was up watching some cartoons around 2 a.m. when I heard knocking coming my window. And I didn't bother looking outside since there is some curtains blocking the view. I told a friend about this today, and they said it was probably some branches or an animal. But I told them I sleep in the second floor of the house, and there a screen window frame outside the window, which is impossible for something to knock from the outside without removing the window screen. Does anyone have any experience with something or have any ideas on what it could be? A year ago, the crone-like spirit of an old woman haunted me. A medium explained that this spirit was my teacher in a past life and that she'd return to guide me in divination and intuition and intuition. My attempts to establish a safe relationship with this spirit were not respected, so I asked a shaman friend for help in clearing this entity from my house. The night before my friend came over, uh, I was so nauseous I could barely sleep. That entire day, I collected things for the ritual. I had 13 red and 13 white carnations, Florida water, the bell, and candles from my own altar and sage. I felt prepared, if uncertain. When I did sleep that night, my dreams were dark and disturbing. My husband, the cat, and the dog all seemed on edge. That morning, my friend arrived shortly after my husband left for work. Opening all the window and the doors, we began setting up the space by lighting candles and smudging every corner of the apartment. The sage burst and crackled, shedding sparks among thick, fragrant smoke. I lost two good duvet covers that day. 
Both pets retreated immediately beneath their respective beds and stayed hidden for the duration. Preparing to call the Cardinal Corners, my friend used his phone's compass to confirm the direction. It was way off. I know my house and my corners and so oriented as correctly. But I felt suspicious, like maybe the entity herself was sabotaging our efforts to remove her. Finally, we began. My friend, beating a low, steady rhythm on his animal skin drum, invoked the guidance and protection of the spirit animals and the protection of the spirit animals of the earth and the sky. I followed behind him, ringing the altar bell as he spit, sprayed mouthfuls of spirit water throughout the apartment. Throughout this, two things rolled around in the back of my mind. The first, what will the neighbors think? The second was that I might vomit. The nausea I'd felt since the night before had increased past the point of simple discomfort. Next, my friend took the red carnations in batches, dipping them into a bowl of spirit water, then circling them in midair, just like we'd done while smudging. He went room by room, discarding the used flowers under the newsprint we'd placed on the coffee table at the center of the apartment. Halfway through his work, he paused and suddenly rushed into the bathroom, becoming violently ill. In that exact moment, I lost the battle with my own nausea. Thank goodness for close friends in multiple bathrooms. Eventually, he'd used all of the carnations throughout the entire space. Perched on our couch, he ended the ceremony with frantic drumming and full voice singing. I could physically feel the energies in my home shifting around us. I gave one last thought to our neighbors and then joined him. My throat raw from the smoke and being sick, I sang out in my loudest voice to move the energies swirling throughout my home. Finally, the ritual was over. We placed the white carnations in a vase on the coffee table. If the ritual had truly exercised the spirits, he said, the carnations would still be white tomorrow when we woke. I thanked my friend and he left. At his instruction, I then bundled the red carnations in the newsprint and carried them to the seaside, burying them in the sandy soil, nearing them in the sandy soil near a banyan tree. I was too tired when I got home to notice if anything felt different. I simply stumbled inside and fell straight into bed, briefly mourning the burn, holes in my duvet. I slept most of the afternoon and all through the night. The following day, the white carnations were still white. I also wrapped these flowers in newspaper, burying them beneath a different tree in the park. As I covered my parcel with the last handfuls of soil, the nausea I'd felt for days cleared instantly, like gray clouds clearing to reveal blue sky. I suddenly felt fine, also very hungry. I returned to a house that felt peaceful and ordered. I paid careful attention over the next several days, trying to suss out whether our banishment had succeeded. The crone was, and nearly a year later still is, gone. Ah, well, I know that was a lot. I've had many strange and spooky experiences throughout my life. Holler if you'd like to hear more. Thanks for reading, folks. This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside, when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds crazy and maybe like we were on drugs, but we were not. We were completely sober. Slowly but surely, the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to a visualization, or perhaps a hypnosis. It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream it did, but at one point we were both there, in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a gray beard. But most remarkably, in the place where his eyes were supposed to be, there were two black holes, as if they had been gauged out and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out, so we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision, or whatever it was, but I remember realizing this was bad and we needed to wake up 
so I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body, I gently woke them up, and we discussed what happened. When we had entered this state, it was around 12 midnight, but when we woke up, it was about 3 a.m., yet it felt like we had only been doing this for 15 minutes. The next day, we both separately drew the man we saw. We were both illustration students. Without having discussed what he looked like, we drew the exact same man and had given him the exact same name. The Weirman. My question is, what was this? A state of hypnosis we entered through the rain. Foley a dew, or something supernatural. If so, does anyone recognize a figure of a lighthouse keeper in a yellow raincoat with no eyes? I worked at a state park and would regularly go days without seeing another person when my boss went away. So my boss was away one week and left his dog with me, and I was wasting time around my lunch break throwing tennis balls for him. I threw one really far away into the woods to give myself some time to eat my sandwich, and maybe ten minutes later he comes bounding out of the woods and drops this, jaw right at my feet. I didn't touch it, but it was this gray-ish mass of skin and bone with bits of torn pink flesh underneath. Then it had about seven or eight of these long, thin, and very sharp teeth sticking out of at strange angles along the jawbone. It wasn't bloody, so it wasn't something the dog had killed, and it stank, so it was probably old. I left it on the concrete where the dog had dropped it, took him with me, and spent a little bit of time searching around in the woods in the direction he had come back, which was unnerving, but I didn't find anything. Then when I went back to where I'd left it, it was just gone, and suddenly the dog started growling at the woods and his hackles went up. Right then I got in my truck. Dog jumped in back, and I went home for the day. When my uncle was in his teens and early twenties, he used to go on a yearly backpacking trip in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest near Mount Baker National Forest with a group of friends. They, there were five of them, knew each other from high school and over the years as they went their separate ways in life, college, etc. The trip became a way for them to reconnect with one another. Anyway, the first time they made this backpacking trip, they were cresting a peak and came across a wide valley view. They were off trail and making pace cross country, but could navigate well enough given geography. My uncle in particular is a pretty experienced outdoorsman and was even back then. To their surprise, especially given that there weren't any trails nearby for at least a couple miles, the group saw a large house on the side of a small lake. There was a small water plane parked on a dock adjacent to the house. But other than this, everything was entirely wild. No trails, no campsites, nothing. The group was shocked, but didn't think much of it the first time. It seemed to be a pretty rad house, so they assumed it belonged to some rich somebody and that it was just a private retreat. It was still pretty cool, though, so they decided to return to that mountain crest every time they went on this trip to look at the house. Well, three or four years later, when they came across the house, there was no plane on the dock. They figured this meant that nobody was home. This time, they decided they were going to check out the house, so they made their way down, which took a while through the thick trails forest. What they came to was a remarkably fancy, modern-style cabin home. Three floors, huge windows, a massive deck with a state of the art barbecue. Everything one would want in a sick-ass hidden mountain retreat. Cool. While they were poking around, the plane landed. Instead of running and hiding, the group decided to explain the situation. So they did when they met a nice gentleman who had flown in. He was very kind and courteous and pleased to show them his vacation house. From then on, each time they went on the trip, they would stop there for a night if the plane was present. Only one year my uncle became curious. What's the deal with this place? So at night, while they were sleeping in the house, he crept around and investigated a few of the many rooms it had. In the basement, he found what explains everything. Massive piles of weed in brick form stacked row upon row next to stacks of cash. 
Instead of freaking out, he went back to sleep and didn't tell his friends until they had left the next day. Not exactly spooky, but I feel like it fits in with the vibe of this threat. A few years back, my fiancé and I went up to stay at her parents' property in Northern California for a weekend to camp, hike, do some astrophotography, and generally just enjoy nature. This place is a good 20 minutes from any real town, and far enough from any big city that you can faintly see the glow of the Milky Way at night. The property is pretty huge and has a cabin, but we both prefer sleeping out under the stars, so we set an air mattress in the bed of my truck and pulled up next to the pond. We got there a little after three in the afternoon, and after getting everything set up, we decided to go for a walk. This being just a quick walk, I left my phone, wallet, keys, etc., in my backpack to avoid any distractions even for just a little bit. When we got back about a half hour later, I noticed that my backpack was zipped open and laying on its side. I was sure that I left it zipped up and standing up. I was concerned and brought it up to my fiance, But she convinced me that I probably just remembered wrong, as I sometimes do. The night goes on and some clouds roll in, ruining our chance to stargaze, so we decided to get to bed a little sooner than normal to get an earlier start the next morning. After some wilderness sexy times, we hit the hay. Sometimes I have trouble sleeping at night, so while she sleeps, I'm often left laying there for an hour or so until I'm actually out. It's never bothered me too much. But this night in particular, I remember wishing I could have just fallen asleep. A little while after we both went to bed, I heard something splashing in the pond next to us. I didn't think much of it. Probably just a small animal, maybe a deer. Worst case scenario, maybe it was a mountain lion, but I've heard they don't bother campers all that often anyway, so I wasn't worried. It wasn't until I heard the word hay from somewhere across the pond that I was legitimately freaked out. My heart was beating out of my chest. I turned my head to see that my fiancé was still fast asleep, which was good, because I don't even want to imagine how she would have reacted. I laid in silence for what felt like hours, but probably just about five seconds later I heard the word hay again. This time it was a little closer than before, and I knew it wasn't just the wind or my ears playing tricks on me. One afternoon in Tempe, Arizona, a man walked into a hotel where I worked. He had a coat on a pea-green military type coat, and butcher paper. Yes, he had butcher paper around himself like some kind of tube top. Under his coat like a shirt. In addition, one of his legs was twice as big as the other. He asked to use the payphone in the lobby. I told him, sure not yet realizing how weird he looked. He was obscured by the desk and the entry door. We started out with a weird vibe the moment he crossed the lobby to the phone. When we finally got a chance to look at him, he walked a bit slow. However, this made sense as his leg appeared swollen. He then made a call and turned slightly to keep me and my co-worker in his attention, sort of out of his peripheral vision. Very soon, we could tell he wasn't listening to anyone and the phone made noises like it was off the hook. I decided that was enough and demanded he leave, which he did abruptly by our side door. Now the really weird part. My co-worker took a picture of him on that payphone with an old flip phone. In the digital pixelation, he was moving, which rendered him blurrier than the rest of the picture. He looked like his face was an oversized, toothy, grinning skull. Black eyes and a hole where his nose should be. It was so bizarre. It reminds me of the story about the man made of parts and the mirrored sunglasses, a story from Victoria, England, in which a man encountered a man he thought was made of parts. Later that day, a police officer came to the hotel asking if we had seen a man fitting the same description. I acknowledged that we had and told the police officer what occurred. I then inquired why he was asking about this bizarre man. The police officer stated that the man was seen in a nearby park by a couple who later reported that the man had suddenly vanished into thin air. 
just a few yards away from them. This occurred in late 2019 before the clock down. I haven't heard anything further about the unknown man or whatever he was. So I need some advice. I live in the backwoods of NEPA, and yesterday, while hiking into the state game lands, I heard my nephew screaming for help. Mind you, I am three miles from any roads, and they were miles away shopping. My dog was terrified. I was wary and ignored the yelling and just pretended it didn't happen. It went off and on for an hour or so, and then silence. I continued my way back home through the woods when I was done. Last night, after a bunch of storms rolled through, I hear my dog's collar tags tingling outside, like he's running, walking all sorts of tingles. He was next to me, his collar off for the night. He then proceeded to go hide upstairs next to my dad for the night. He's never done that before. Am I experiencing a skinwalker? Am I experiencing a skinwalker? I feel like I led something home yesterday. I hunt and camp, and I'm not afraid of the woods. I still go solo backpacking. Back when I was in my early 20s, I went camping or hunting by myself in northern Georgia, near a town called Hiawassee. Camp was a mile or two down a sketchy dirt road, and I hiked up a mountain to a spot I liked to hunt another half mile or so. Anyway, it started to get dark, and it started to snow, and I didn't see any deer. So I gathered my gear and decided to head back to camp. When I got up and turned around, I was about 15 yards away from the biggest black bear I've ever seen. We locked eyes, and I froze. Easily a 500 pounds or more bear. All I had was my 12-gauge slugger. Thankfully, the bear turned and ran away. I slept in my car that night as I was alone out there. And for a while, I was afraid of camping alone that deep in the woods. Eric Johnson was a man who belonged to two worlds, the bustling realm of his family in the serene depths of the ocean, tall and muscular with a weathered face that spoke of countless hours spent under the sun. Eric possessed a rugged charm that matched his adventurous spirit. His salt and pepper hair framed a pair of piercing blue eyes that reflected his deep love for the sea. The ocean had always called to him, captivating his imagination with its mysteries and enchanting beauty. But hidden beneath Eric's love for the ocean was an unyielding fear, an unspoken dread of the unknown lurking within the deep. This fear had its roots in a childhood incident etched into his memory. As a young boy, Eric had witnessed a terrifying creature emerge from the shadowy depths of the ocean, its monstrous form haunting his dreams ever since. Despite this deep-rooted phobia, Eric couldn't resist the pull of the ocean's allure. It was as if an invisible force beckoned him to confront his fears, to unravel the mysteries that had plagued him for so long. And so, with trepidation and determination intertwined, Eric made the decision to embark on an expedition to an uncharted region of the ocean, an endeavor that would test his courage in ways he couldn't have imagined. Accompanied by a team of marine researchers and fellow divers, Eric descended into the watery abyss. The journey began with a mix of excitement and unease as strange and foreboding signs began to reveal themselves. A missing research vessel whispered tales of bizarre occurrences in the deep and eerie oceanic phenomena that defied rational explanation. All of these cast a haunting aura over the expedition. But it was during a routine dive beneath the weight of unfathomable depths that Eric's worst nightmares manifested into a chilling reality as he maneuvered through the dark currents a sudden shift in the water alerted him to a presence unlike anything he had encountered before. His heart raced as he turned to face the behemoth before him, a creature of colossal proportions, dwarfing any known species that inhabited the ocean's depths. Its massive form, resembling a monstrous shark from the pages of ancient legends, sent shivers down Eric's spine. 
Its cold, malevolent eyes pierced through the murky waters, locking onto his own, freezing him in place. The creature possessed a primal power that surpassed even that of the mighty white shark, an embodiment of pure terror that awakened every dormant fear within Eric's soul. In a frenzy of violence, the monstrous beast attacked the team, its ferocity leaving no room for escape. Panic consumed the divers, their futile attempts to ward off the creature only feeding its insatiable hunger. The once unified team became a scattered chaos, their cries swallowed by the unforgiving depths. But Eric, driven by an instinct for survival and a desperate will to defy his fate, found himself doing the unimaginable. He became the antithesis of his fellow divers, moving with calculated precision, dodging the creature's relentless assaults. His mind, fueled by fear and adrenaline, deciphered a pattern in its relentless attacks a pattern he exploited to his advantage. Finally, a moment of opportunity arose. Eric seized it, swimming with every ounce of strength left in his battered body. In a burst of sheer willpower, he broke free from the clutches of the abyssal horror, ascending towards the surface where salvation awaited. Gasping for air, his heart pounding, Eric pulled himself onto the safety of the waiting boat. He glanced back at the haunting abyss, knowing deep within his soul that he would never return to those treacherous depths again. The harrowing encounter had forever altered his perception of the ocean, transforming it from a sanctuary of wonder to a realm of nightmares. As the boat sailed back to port, Eric carried with him the scars of his encounter, an indelible mark etched upon his spirit. In this report, I wish to remain completely anonymous. I'm a police officer, and I had a sighting of a strange humanoid werewolf-looking creature while patrolling a rural section of Baxter County, Arkansas. Another officer had spotted the creature at a four-way stop, and I was sent to investigate. When I arrived at the location, the peculiar-looking humanoid emerged and started walking across one of the roads, disappearing quickly into the nearby brush. As it turns out, this area has a long history of werewolf-type activity, along with unexplained animal deaths and disappearances. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to assess the creature's size before it vanished into the wooded area. I conducted a search of the location and found several sets of tracks on the dirt roads, but due to recent rainfall, they were not clear enough to determine what might have been responsible. This report is the only official complaint from an officer thus far, although other officers from the same department have come forward to share their knowledge of the area. One officer even mentioned that his own grandfather had told him about a werewolf-like creature living in this vicinity. Due to its remote location, very few people ever venture there, and there had been no other reports until now. Since then, a strange and the stories about strange and disturbing creatures has emerged from around the world. Some reports, including those on sites like Reddit, mention sightings of werewolf-like creatures. While this is not a new phenomenon, as there have been reports of such beings for centuries in America, one incident stood out among the others. The incident involved a mother and child who witnessed what they believed to be a Bigfoot near their home, just outside of town. They managed to position themselves with a camera and started recording. What followed would be familiar to those who have seen werewolves before. The description given resembled a dog or wolf suffering from mange, which causes hair loss and other physical ailments. However, there was an important note, the apparent foul smell emitted by this sickly-looking animal. Yes, dogmen, Bigfoot, and werewolves have all been associated with strong odors, and this particular sighting seemed highly likely considering the location. Similar sightings have been reported in these parts, and the locals are aware of what they might be encountering. Another report involved two separate officers, each with their own stories about encounters, while patrolling this specific part of Arkansas. Most of these encounters took place at night, and although there is little information available about them, witnesses commonly describe the creatures as being around five to six feet tall, gaunt, and thin. 
glowing eyes are also frequently mentioned, which seems to be a common characteristic among these types of encounters. One officer shared that while in the same area, he observed something moving swiftly into the trees. At first, he thought it might be an animal, but then he heard another report over his radio about a Bigfoot sighting nearby. This proximity unsettled him, making him uncertain about what he had truly witnessed. In yet another report, a pilot flying his small plane around 5 a.m. encountered what appeared to be a massive, hairy creature. Several other pilots in the rural region of Arkansas had also spotted it. According to the officer, residents of these areas have been sharing stories for years about encountering these strange creatures and some claim to know people who hunt them. Among the most intriguing encounters, I found one involving a police officer from Cowling County. He responded to an animal complaint near the town of De Quincey one evening. As he arrived at the scene, he saw two sets of eyes peering from behind a nearby tree, emitting an extremely bright glow. This was his first sighting of what he believed to be a huge canine-like creature. However, when it opened its mouth and let out an otherworldly growl, he backed away in fear. The officer described the creature as approximately eight feet tall, covered in dark, smoky fur. Lastly, the final sighting occurred on Highway 165 near Wilmer, where another officer had responded to a call about children claiming to have seen a Bigfoot or wolf-like figure. According to their description, this entity had very long arms, hands resembling those of a raccoon or a human, and it was enough to frighten the officer away from the scene. At that time, I was a Presbyterian minister, visiting the bustling city of Chicago with my young son. Our purpose for being there was to explore the wonders of the Museum of Science and Industry, a place that promised to ignite our imaginations and inspire our curiosity. Little did we know that our visit would take an unexpected turn into the realms of mystery and intrigue as we navigated the labyrinthine corridors of the museum. Marveling at the exhibits that unfolded before our eyes, we inadvertently strayed from the well-trodden path. The hallways seemed to twist and turn, leading us deeper into the heart of the building, away from the familiar attractions that drew the attention of other visitors. Lost in this maze of unfamiliar territory, we stumbled upon a room that seemed out of place, as if it existed in a different dimension from the rest of the museum. The air hung heavy with an aura of secrecy and anticipation. Our eyes were drawn to a large glass case that stood in the center, its contents obscured by a veil of curiosity. As we approached the case, our senses tingling with anticipation, we were confronted by a sight that defied explanation. Within the glass enclosure lay small humanoid bodies, their forms eerily preserved for all eternity. They possessed a delicate fragility, yet their presence emanated another worldly energy that sent shivers down our spines. Before we could fully process the gravity of what we were witnessing, a group of men descended upon us, their purpose as enigmatic as the beings encased in glass. They demanded my immediate attention, forcibly guiding me to a secluded corner of the room. Papers were thrust before me, demanding my signature without explanation or respite. Fear mingled with confusion as I complied, their stern gazes leaving no room for defiance. I was granted no opportunity to question or resist. The ordeal was over as abruptly as it had begun, and we were allowed to leave the weight of secrecy heavy upon my conscience. Confounded by the enigmatic encounter, my young son and I departed the museum, carrying with us a story that defied conventional explanation. Years later, in 1974, my son, now grown, recounted the bizarre incident to Sharon Larson of the Center for UFO Studies. The memories resurfaced, a reminder of the extraordinary circumstances we had encountered within the Museum of Science and Industry. The details were etched in our minds, forever ingrained in our family's history. To this day, the questions linger. What was the significance of those small humanoid bodies? Who were those men that compelled me to sign those mysterious papers? 
The answers remain elusive, hidden within the depths of an enigma that continues to captivate the imagination of those willing to explore the uncharted realms of possibility. On March 22, 2013, I, Officer Mike Milnor was checking out a report of missing livestock in the area around Luca Chukai, Arizona. I joined Navajo officers in the search and investigation, hoping to find some clues as to where the animals had been taken. We couldn't find any dead animals initially, but Officer Larry Wanuka soon discovered heavy footprints that belonged to a single set of tracks. These tracks led us towards a valley nestled between two close-together cliffs, and there we found the gruesome scene where the animals had been killed and taken, their throats ripped open and tongues removed. I decided to climb up into one of the cliff areas armed with my rifle, keeping watch for any signs of more of these creatures. What happened next was truly astonishing. I later shared the experience exclusively with cryptozoologists. Recalling how, while I was at my post, I heard the sound of something large approaching. I couldn't see anything, but I kept hearing it get. Closer and closer, I recounted. I turned on my light and saw a towering dark figure about 15 to 20 feet away. It was huge, yet its features were indistinct. No eyes, no mouth, just plain skin covering its body. It was completely naked devoid of any identifiable gender characteristics. Before I could react, the being swiftly darted away. It was just a crazy moment. I've been working in this area for about ten years now, and I've never heard of or seen anything like that, I added. While I mentioned the notion of skinwalkers, I must admit that I don't believe it was one. However, my knowledge of Navajo mythology and folklore is limited. Nevertheless, my department chief seems to have an idea about the identity of the creature we encountered, referring to a specific shaman. Initially, we laughed it off, I concluded, but after witnessing what this entity did to our animals, there's no doubt in my mind that it exists. It's worth noting that skinwalkers have long been a topic of speculation. While many Navajo people believe in them, state and law enforcement officials often remain skeptical. Back in 2009, a viral video supposedly showing an upright walking figure stirred intrigue. It marked the first time an officer had such a close encounter with one of these creatures. In 2011, the FBI released documents about skinwalkers, but they were largely dismissed and never gained traction in the mainstream media. These leaked documents are now nearly impossible to find. When contacted, the Navajo Nation Police Department, or NNPD, offered no comment on the story. They seem to be extremely cautious about what they choose to publicize and respond to, likely aiming to downplay any rumors or accusations. My name's Dean. I used to be a ranger of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park located in Northern Carolina. I was guiding a group of Spanish tourists and none of them knew English. Our communication was more than terrible. I left them near a river returning to base. Two hours go by. I returned to see if everybody was fine and if nobody was lost. We went back to a safe place. The afternoon was turning into night and being there would be extremely dangerous. We arrived and one of the tourists told me that we'd forgotten somebody, a young woman with a notebook. He told me she was trying to collect some data about birds and insects. Immediately I went to search for her. I took everything I had before going. I told everybody to stay there and I'd be back in a half hour flat. The forest was dark. The insect noises. I heard her distressed call near the river. I arrived there and she was being attacked by bats. I grabbed my gun, firing several shots into the air. The bats fled, and the woman had some superficial bite wounds. She panicked and fainted. I waited for her to recover, then took her back to the safe place so I can get her first aid. We were walking. She was having some difficulties, even if I was helping her. The forest was dark and suddenly began to rain. As we walked harder, some hours had passed, and we had arrived. 
The other tourists were waiting for our return and became shocked at what had happened. I gave her first aid. All the tourists asked to get back to the city. I told them that would not be possible in that condition. It was raining a lot, the track was wet, and we would all probably suffer accidents. I told everybody to sleep, and when the morning appeared, the young woman was dead. Her body had more wounds than last night. An old man had some bite wounds on his left arm and did not wake up. His wife had tried to wake him, but when he finally woke, he had a severe heart attack and died. The old woman in tears. The other two tourists tried to calm her down and asked me what happened. After hours of searching, night came, and this time I was completely alone. Five years of working as a ranger of this park gave me the knowledge to be prepared for anything, or so I thought. At midnight, I heard a strange noise sounding like a huge airplane or something. I decided to go see what was happening. I arrived and saw something that nobody would believe in my words. Giant bats, and I'm not talking about regular bats. These were massive, the size of humans, and what's worse is I saw them in the light. They were human hybrids, part human, part bat, and they were devouring the body of a wolf with hands and claws and a face that looked like a demon. I panicked, running faster than I could. These things saw me flying off in the sky and taking my direction, almost trying to catch me. The woods were dark and my light only prevailed through so much darkness. I entered a small cavern that would provide me ample coverage. I guess you can call it a cavern. It was more like a little outing in the wall, but they were flying in the air looking for me. They looked like large, deformed black dogs, taller than humans, red eyes and long tails. I shot at one of them, and they came screaming in my direction. I waited for the right moment to run, returning back when I had arrived. I could still hear them flying around in the distance. I told everybody to keep quiet, immediately radioing my boss, telling him we have an issue. He asked that I speak with him in private as it sounded like he kind of already knew what was going on. When I spoke to him, he threw some paperwork in front of me and told me to sign it. It was an NDA. He looked at me and told me, This is not going to be the first time you have to sign these. Better get used to it on this job which is why I have to be very careful with my identity. At the beginning of this story, I told you my name was Dean. Obviously, I'm sure you've already guessed that's not my real name. It's merely a placeholder. I guess there are several other rangers who have seen these same bats. What they are, I'm not sure. Could they be the elusive bat squatch? Possibly. But they looked far more hideous, and unlike a bat squatch, they were not covered in hair. They were far worse. Unfortunately, not always, as it seems in these national parks, and many of these things we're told to keep quiet about. All I can say is for anyone wanting to venture out at night, be very, very careful whether you're in a national park or not. A peaceful Mohican village was nestled in the heart of the forest. Men, women, and children were engaged in their everyday tasks, cooking, crafting, and storytelling. Suddenly, a deafening roar shattered the tranquility. Panic ensued as the villagers looked towards the nearby woods, fear etched on their faces. An unknown predator, monstrous and swift, lunged out of the woods. The villagers scrambled to defend themselves, wielding spears and bows. Chaos and desperation filled the air. The predator unleashed a fury upon the Mohicans, attacking with relentless ferocity. Men, women, and children fall victim to its savage onslaught. Amidst the chaos, only one man, Winged Hawk, manages to survive. Covered in dirt and blood, he clutches a wounded arm, pain etched on his face. Winged Hawk looks around, his eyes filled with a mix of horror and determination. Tears stream down his face as he gazes at the lifeless bodies of his fellow tribesmen, voice trembling. I'll do my vengeance. Winged Hawk rises to his feet, his body filled with a newfound resolve. He glances towards the dark woods, his eyes burning with a mix of rage and sorrow. Winged Hawk prepares himself for the journey ahead. He dons a ceremonial headdress adorned with feathers symbolizing his connection to his ancestors. With a solemn expression, 
winged hawk tightens the grip on his bow and arrows. He carries a tomahawk, his weapon of choice, in his quest for vengeance. Winged hawk ventures deep into the dense forest, his footsteps determined and unwavering. He navigates through thick undergrowth and treacherous terrain. Winged Hawk discovers a hidden cave, a place filled with ancient symbols and remnants of his tribe's history. He kneels, bowing his head in prayer and seeking guidance from his ancestors. Winged Hawk emerges from the cave, infused with spiritual strength and resolve. He knows he must confront the unknown predator that decimated his people. Winged Hawk arrives at an abandoned temple, its crumbling walls a testament to the passage of time. Shadows dance around him, as if the forest itself holds its breath. The unknown predator emerges from the shadows, its eyes gleaming with malicious intent. Winged hawk locks eyes with the beast, unflinching in the face of imminent danger. A fierce battle ensues, the clash of weapons and roars filling the air. Winged hawk fights with unmatched agility and skill, his every movement calculated and precise. With each strike, Winged Hawk feels the weight of his fallen tribe on his shoulders. Determination fuels his every action as he refuses to yield, unleashing his vengeance upon the predator. Winged Hawk lands a fatal blow, striking true and bringing the unknown predator to its knees. As it takes its final breaths, Winged Hawk gazes into its eyes, a mix of triumph and sorrow in his own. Winged Hawk kneels beside the lifeless predator, his hand gently touching the beast's hide. A single tear falls, carrying the weight of his people's loss and the fulfillment of his vengeance. I was stationed in Anbar province, Iraq tasked with watching over a bridge that spanned some railroad tracks. It was October 31st, and a freak electrical storm suddenly rolled in, casting an eerie atmosphere over the area. As the storm intensified, I couldn't help but notice that the antennas on my upper marred vehicle began to flicker and emit an otherworldly glow, resembling those glass electricity balls I used to play with as a kid. It was an unsettling sight, to say the least. What made the situation even spookier was the fact that my second truck was positioned about one kilometer away, keeping a watchful eye on another section of the road. With the storm raging and the night being Halloween night, we felt isolated and alone in the darkness. To ease our apprehension, I made the decision to flip the truck around so that my turret faced the bridge. This way, both the driver and I could maintain a watchful gaze on our surroundings, ensuring our safety. As the hours wore on, the storm continued to unleash its fury upon us. The rain fell in torrents, drumming relentlessly on the vehicle's metal exterior. The occasional thunderclaps rattled our nerves, accentuating the already tense atmosphere. It was a night like no other, filled with an uncanny sense of being watched. Despite the swirling fears and unease that had settled upon us, the night passed without any notable incidents. By the time morning finally arrived, we breathed a collective sigh of relief, eager to leave the bridge behind and put the unsettling experience behind us. Nothing out of the ordinary had occurred, yet the memory of that night would forever remain etched in our minds. Looking back, it was a surreal and bizarre encounter, a Halloween night like no other. Whether it was a mere trick of the storm or something more supernatural, I couldn't say for certain. So this is a story comes from a very, very close family friend of my grandpa. His name is Neil. He's the kind of person that wouldn't lie about something like this, and I honestly believe his story. This story was told while I was on a hunting trip with my grandpa father, a few of my uncles, Neil, and one or two other people. I don't know exactly how the conversation led to talking about strange and unknown things seen in the wild, but here we were. This was a few years ago, so forgive me if I've forgotten some details. Neil's story a few years back, he described it to be about early 90s. 
Myself and one of my friends had gotten permission to go and hunt jackrabbits on another one of my friend's property out in a very remote part of Western I.D. I can't remember exactly where. But they had come an hour or two from the wiser area in I.D. The property was out in the middle of the desert, quite far from any small town or city. We entered on the north side of the property over a cattle guard and through a gate. The property was kinda in a valley and was divided into a very large flat, er, plain, mostly on one half, and then on the other was a very large hill that spanned the length of the private land and had an elevation of probably 200 to 300 feet, give or take. That night, we had been working the flatter part of the land with the spotlight on my truck and flashlights in hand, shooting the rabbits. It was a clear night and the moon was probably three-fourths full, so it was relatively easy to see some elements of the property by the moonlight. We started a little after dusk, and by this time it was about midnight and were about two, three yards down the length of the property when we heard this unhuman, blood-curdling scream come from the eastern side where the hill ran. I looked at my friend and we both froze. We were at the truck using the spotlight looking for rabbits when it happened. We were probably 200 to 300 yards from base of the hill. So the top of the hill was probably another 100 yards or so from the base to the top. As I started to scan the hillside with my scope, the creature had screamed again. I then followed the sound and saw a tall, lanky, humanoid figure standing with the upper half of its body silhouetted against the sky at the top of the hill. I had fired a shot toward it from my point twenty-two, knowing it wouldn't make it to the creature. But I wanted to try and get it to move up and over the hill so I could get a better look at it. But instead, then, this thing started to move down the hill toward us. Right after that happened, we booked it the closest side of the property, found a gate, and shot the lock off and drove away from there as fast as we could. To this day, I still don't know what I saw, but it scared the shit out of me. So there's Neil's story to the best of my recollection. I would love to hear what y'all think, Skinwalker, Wendigo. Let me know. In high school, my friend and I, both 17 male, we'll call him Jay, frequented trails to go for smoke walks. On this fall afternoon, we went to a familiar trail in a moderately wooded area. One blunt into our walk, and an odd man comes on our path. He startled us. He was middle-aged and plainly dressed, but I think he had some condition. He looked like a stocky Ethan Hawk with crazy eyes, and he spoke to us like a child. The childish man was rambling about Hyde, and Go Seek frantically asking, Have you seen two kids? Jay and I were both puzzled. We took obvious note of the creepy man in the woods asking about kids, but we didn't know what to do or say. We ignored him and continued on the trail to spark another. On our way back to the trail access, we see the childish man on the path, yet now with a tall, slim man. Jay urged me to get us out of there. Jay was already non-confrontational, and we both felt an eerie tension. Yet the whole thing was fishy, and I didn't want to regret doing nothing if some kids were at risk. I asked why the hell is your friend asking about some kids? They both give the same weird hide and go seek with two kids. The tall man claimed to be the father. He was more with it than his childish companion. He kept questioning my concern for his kids. The tall man was getting angry, veering on threatening. I had a bad gut feeling, but decided to leave this whole weird encounter behind. Yet on our way out of the woods, we see a boy and a girl stand up from a wheat field. They just rose up like a poem. I observed to see if they needed help. Yet they were cheerfully waving at us. I held a thumbs up and they signaled back. I got in the car with Jay. We got the hell out of there. Was it just a good father and uncle playing innocent games with their two kids? Was I being nosy and blowing things out of proportion? To this day, I bear an uneasy guilt anxiety for those kids. I never thought to write about this story. Jay and I still reminisce on it. I'll never forget the moment we first came upon the childish man. Edit, I just want to clarify that this was almost definitely a harmless case. However, 
At the time, it was so fishy that I was positive we were being filmed in a special Woodland episode of What Would You Do? That said, I was also aware at the time that the first man more than likely had a disability of some kind. His appearance at first was truly startling, and the comportment of the tall man definitely raised my suspicions. Hi everyone. My partner and I just got back from a long camping trip in northern Arizona. Marble Canyon, Vermilion Cliffs, and finally in the Kaibab National Forest, where this encounter took place. We were driving off-roading all day on the forest roads deep in the forest, near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. We were hunting hard for the perfect camping spot, and it was starting to get dark, and my partner was getting frustrated. So we told ourselves, we'll go to the end of the next trail and camp there. Unfortunately, where that trail ended was at an expansive burn scar, forest that was completely wiped out by fire last summer. Very few living trees remained standing. It was spooky, but we decided to make the best of the situation. After getting camp set up and eating dinner, we were just hanging out by the fire. We started hearing some snapping branches in the woods and light up our flashlights. We see nothing. I grab my shotgun just in case. At this point, we're trying to be as quiet as possible, listening very intently to the woods. It was a clear night, but no moon. It was very dark beyond the reaches of the firelight. Then we hear what sounds like a whisper of a woman. We try so hard to make out the words, but it sounded foreign, like another language. It shortly thereafter grows to a crying sound, then turns to wailing, like someone in incredible pain. We were absolutely terrified at this point. The sound eventually stops, and we started to feel very unwelcome and very cold. We knew immediately this was a very strange paranormal experience, but not sure if this like a skinwalker or maybe just a ghost. What do you think? I travel often for work, and I was driving through New Mexico on a I-40. I drive about 40, 50,000 miles a year, and I have never seen anything paranormal. I have driven this route, but not for about four years. I'm driving west on I-40 and out of the blue. I spotted a blur moving down the hill mountain at a ridiculously fast speed. In a span of about five seconds, my brain did its best to make sense of what I was seeing. Coyote was the first thing that came to mind the way it was moving. It looked like a canine. The next thing I realized was that this thing was huge. Maybe the size of a horse. I've often seen horses run down the fence lines on hills, and that was my next thought. But the shape was wrong. The speed was also way off. This creature was flying down the side of this mountain. The whole time, I'm really not feeling anything but confusion, and nothing is really registering. It's off just because it's happening so fast. I have a thought that we are going to meet at a point about two to three hundred yards down the road. So I think to myself, when I drive by, I'll get a closer look. When I passed where we should have met, there was nothing. No fence, no houses, nothing to explain a horse. There was no sign of the animal, like it just ran through a portal or something. There were no shrubs trees or anything that could have hidden the animal. At this point, I got a very eerie sense of dread, like I had to get away. I pulled into a gas station about 30 men down the road. This is what really creeped me out. I felt like I couldn't trust anyone. I had this uncomfortable feeling of mistrust and suspicion. I felt like everyone I came across knew what I saw. Normal, everyday people. It's like I felt I was going to run into someone or something dangerous. I drove on through Gallup and up to Shiprock and into Cortez. I can't shake the feeling of fear and couldn't bring myself to shower late at night in a strange hotel. I've never been one to believe in paranormal stories but I just can't explain to myself what this was. I keep thinking about it, and I just can't logically explain it. Horse-sized wolf, canine dairy gray hair with white belly. Fast, extremely fast. Has anyone ever seen anything similar in the area? I'm from Texas, never been around reservations or Native America much. 
I'm just very confused and would like to hear about anything similar. A military man, John, went outside to have a smoke. He lives in the hills surrounding Deadwood, South Dakota. He spotted two kids walking up a hill. They stopped and looked at John, which spooked him. They were wearing hoodies and looked very strange. Their eyes were completely black. They started to come across the street, walking directly towards John, who introduced himself to them. They continued to advance towards him. Frightened, he retreated into the house. Inside, he asked his wife if she heard him talking to the kids. She never heard anything. They soon went to bed. John then noticed one of the boys outside his window. He rushed to bolt the front door, as one of them was there too. He never made it to the door. For whatever reason, he turned around and went back to the bedroom, where he saw the boy standing outside his window. He went to grab his pistol. He wanted to scare them off. He assumed they were wearing masks. One was at the window and another was at the door. He was extremely scared now. The next thing he remembered was waking up in bed. His wife informed him that he had been gone for an hour and a half. I did hear the door open and close. You weren't there, she told him. John had left the house at 4 a.m. and didn't return home until 5.30 a.m. I stood atop the remote watchtower in the heart of the White River National Forest, Colorado. The breathtaking beauty of the vast wilderness stretched out before me, a canvas of nature waiting to be explored. As a diligent park ranger named Zoe, I took my responsibilities seriously, ensuring the safety of visitors and the preservation of this pristine environment. But there was more to me than just the uniform I wore. In my free time, I embraced my passion for art, wielding a paintbrush instead of a ranger's guidebook. The wilderness inspired me, and I would often capture its magnificence on canvas, the colors dancing across the white expanse, bringing the landscape to life. As dusk settled over the forest, the once familiar tranquility gave way to an eerie stillness. A chill ran down my spine, and I sensed a presence lurking in the shadows, beyond the reach of my watchful eyes. Unseen entities tormented me during the night, whispering dark secrets that seemed to seep into my very being. Their voices echoed through the trees, playing mind games that threatened to unhinge my sanity. Driven by a mix of curiosity and apprehension, I stepped outside the watchtower, determined to confront the enigma that haunted my nights. I cautiously moved through the underbrush, my senses heightened and heart pounding. And then I saw it, a figure in the distance, a predator with the shape of a bipedal dogman, its eyes gleaming with an unnatural intelligence. Fear surged through me, but I refused to let it paralyze me. With trembling hands, I reached for the weapon holstered at my side, knowing that my only chance of survival lay in facing this unknown creature head on. I shouted into the darkness, demanding answers, demanding to know why it tormented me. In a flash, the dogman lunged, its razor-sharp claws tearing through the air. Instinct took over, and I fought back, battling the beast with all my strength. Pain seared through my body as its claws found their mark, but I refused to yield. In a desperate struggle, I managed to seize my gun, aiming for the creature's heart. The shot rang out, piercing the night, and the dogman's agonized scream echoed through the forest. With newfound resolve, I held my breath, waiting for backup to arrive. The creature, wounded and startled, fled into the darkness, leaving me battered and bloodied but alive. Backup arrived to find me unconscious, lying amidst the wilderness I had sworn to protect. They whisked me away to safety, my body battered but my spirit unbroken. As I regained consciousness, I knew that my encounter with a dogman was not the end, but a beginning. A testament to the unseen dangers that lurked within the depths of the forest. In the days that followed, as I recovered, I delved deeper into the legends and lore of the area seeking answers to the mysterious entity that had attacked me. It became clear that I had stumbled upon a hidden world where myth and reality converged in the darkest corners of the White River National Forest.
And so, armed with knowledge and an unwavering determination, I returned to my post atop the watchtower. The paintbrush in my hand became not only a tool of artistic expression, but a symbol of resilience. I vowed to protect this wilderness, not only from the tangible threats, but from the unseen forces that sought to unravel its delicate balance. The wilderness watched over me as I stood strong, ready to face whatever terrors may come. For in the heart of the forest, amidst the whispers of the unknown, a park ranger named Zoe embraced her duty with unyielding courage, ensuring that the secrets of the wild remain just that, secrets forever entwined with the untamed beauty of nature. I had one of the most terrifying experiences of my life as a police officer in Beaver Township, Ohio. It was the early morning hours of October 25th, 2018, around 5.3 a.m. I was on patrol with three other officers from the Beaver Police Department, driving down a desolate road called Davis Road. As we were driving, something caught our attention near the edge of the road, so we decided to pull over and investigate. Out of nowhere, a massive figure resembling a man appeared before us. It stood about seven feet tall and was so close to our car that we could have reached out and touched it. The sight was chilling. Its face was elongated and bony, with huge fangs protruding from its mouth. Its eyes were dark, reminiscent of a shark's gaze. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. Before this encounter, we had noticed movement along one of the roads within our line of sight but we weren't sure what it was. Our curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to follow it. As we reached the spot where it had been seen, all four of us witnessed the creature in full view. It was unbelievably close, and we felt as though it could pounce on us at any moment. One of my fellow officers said, It was like nothing I've ever seen before, and the rest of us agreed. The creature defied any explanation. I immediately knew it wasn't a bear or any known creature. It took only seconds for our eyes to adjust, and we could clearly see the details of this extraordinary being. Strangely, it seemed to emit its own light source, making it easily visible. The whole experience was surreal and unnerving. We watched as the creature disappeared into the nearby bushes. Two of us left our post to join the other two, forming a group to investigate further. However, our search yielded no additional sightings. All we found was a large hoof mark in the area and some broken bones, among other things. We discussed our encounter and the lack of evidence. It was frustrating because we knew what we had seen, but we also knew that finding proof would be nearly impossible. We were convinced that if this incident made it to the news, it would be quickly retracted or dismissed. It's encounters like these that make us realize how strange and inexplicable our world can be. We are reminded that there are mysterious phenomena and creatures out there lurking in the shadows. Even though we may never find concrete evidence, we share our experiences to shed light on the unknown and to let others know that sometimes the truth lies beyond what we can comprehend. My brother and I were camping outside of Wasp, Tennessee, at the foothills of the Appalachians. Me, him, and two dogs were sitting around a fire at around 2 a.m. A rock the size of a basketball came hurling off the top of the rock face that was about 50 foot up in an arch that landed just short of our fire. We thought maybe it had just rolled from higher up and got some speed, but then we heard growling, not like a mountain lion or a bear much deeper. Our dogs, who were very quiet hunting dogs, began growling with their legs between their tails. We noped right into the tent and got our rifles, like something that can hurl a friggin' rock like cares about bullets. Another time, my uncle and I were hunting South Alabama in a giant old pine tree orchard. We stumbled upon around 15 deer carcasses up in the top of the trees. We summed it up to poachers and went on our way. Once we were in the deer stand, we heard screaming like a woman, but so guttural it made my skin crawl. And for the first time in my life, I saw fear in that man's eyes. 
He looked me in my face, said, Fib, this bullshit, and started gathering our gear. Later on, one of his good friends, full Native American, explained that the sound was a wendigo. I don't know if he was screwing with us or not, but I've never heard a sound like that before. Took me a couple years to go in the woods before or after daylight again. When I was 15, I was at a Boy Scout camp in Illinois. My tent mate was sick, so he went home on Tuesday. Wednesday night, I'm alone in my tent, and I heard what heard like thuds. Between 10 and 12 a minute, I thought little of it and went to sleep. Thursday night, alone again. I need to take a shit about 1 a.m. I walk up to the latrine, and behind me, I start to hear those thuds. Someone is chopping wood with our troop sacks at one in the morning. Someone who then stops, looks directly at me, and then walks away into the woods. I've never been so scared in my life. I heard laughing accompanying the chopping later that night. I reported it to the camp staff, and they did an investigation, which revealed that others heard what I had, and one had even seen the same thing. And to this day, five years later, it's come up empty. This wood chopper hasn't reappeared, and it was confirmed not to be a camper or a staff member. One time, my boyfriend and I were camping out in the wilderness. It was probably close to around 11 p.m. or midnight, and we're both in our tent, laughing and talking before we fall asleep. His dad and stepmom are both doing the same about 50 feet away from us in a camper. The conversation died for a second, and as it was quiet, we hear a freaking roar. Imagine a man full-on roaring, like the most anguished yell I've ever heard before in my life, only it wasn't a man. It was close to it, but way bigger, way more powerful sounding. There's no doubt in my mind that this was not human, but I couldn't think of a single animal it actually matched up with. Neither of us are new to the wilderness. He grew up in that forest and has probably slept more nights out there than he could count. I'm a really big camping nature enthusiast myself and have heard so many different animals make so many different noises. As this is going on, both of us are completely paralyzed, so I know he can hear it right along with me. The noise dies out, and as soon as it's been quiet for more than a few seconds, dozens upon dozens of coyotes start answering back in every direction. Yipping, crying, just everything in this dead quiet forest is completely filled with them calling all over. This goes on for what feels like forever before the yell comes back out again. All of the coyotes stop at once. The only thing you can hear is that roar. It sounds like it's miles away from us, but right next to us, simultaneously. The coyotes all stayed completely silent after that. Both of us have been quiet, listening the entire time. Then the yell goes dead. There's no noise after. The entire forest is silent, and it takes me a minute to ask if he heard it, already knowing that he did. He told me yes, no tone in his voice, just flat and fast. Yes, so I sat frozen in my spot and tried thinking of every animal I've ever heard. In the wild at the zoo, on nature documentaries, the closest thing I can think of is a person, but almost more primitive, way bigger, more powerful, more wild. I ask him, do you know what that was? Have you ever heard anything like that before? He answers with the same dead tone. No, I've never heard that before. Both of us agreed that despite going through every animal in the almanac we could think of, every state of all those animals, hungry, mating, challenging, dying, that could produce that kind of noise, or what kind of animal could be big enough to even make that kind of call, let alone with that, much range and depth, nothing. The next morning we didn't even have to say anything. His dad and stepmom started the morning by asking if we heard it. They said Bigfoot first. Just for the record, I don't disagree at all. This is exactly how I decided that I believed in Sasquatch. I've searched on YouTube and I've found some really similar calls. Nothing is matched perfectly, depth, length of call, that sort of thing. But some of them are almost so spot on that I don't have a problem thinking they're made from the same thing. 
I came to this thread to read other sassy stories, but haven't found one yet, so I figured I'd throw in mine. This happened about three years ago, and I want to hear it again so bad so I can try to record it. I'll be completely open to somebody suggesting an alternative to what it was, but I promise it wasn't any of these things. Cougar, bear, bobcat, lynx, elk, deer, fox, osprey, squirrel, porcupine, beaver, wolf, coyote, person really drunk, high person, songbird, insect, mouse, dog. This is what my mind looked like just trying to find an answer. Definitely one of the craziest few minutes of my life. I used to live in Spain because my father was a government official. We lived near an area that was frequented by pilgrims. I saw a few dead bodies while I was there. A lot of the pilgrims are really old, and they can't handle the physical toll the, the hike takes, so they suddenly drop dead, or they rest on the side of the road, and they never wake up again. I once had the displeasure of seeing one of the corpses up close. The face on the dead woman was contorted. She looked terrified like death had taken her by surprise. As for supernatural, I remember in 2013 I got up early and I traveled to a path that was frequented by pilgrims. I wanted to go stargazing and there was relatively little light pollution out in the countryside. When I arrived at my usual spot, I noticed there was a man in brown robes not too far off in the distance. When I yelled a greeting towards him, he turned his face towards me. He was unnaturally pale as if he were a corpse or gravely ill. His eyes were bloodshot and he looked like he was crying. He said not a word to me and turned around again, continuing to stare off into the distance. I remained for a few minutes, but shivers kept running through my spine and I decided I shouldn't be there, so I left. Later that evening, a train derailed at Santiago de Compostela which is the end point of the pilgrimage, and 80 people died. I think this is all a coincidence, and I probably met some sleepy pilgrim. But I told my grandma, and she said it was the spirit of St. James, the Muslim killer, as the pilgrim's path is dedicated to him. She says he was trying to warn me of the tragedy that was going to take place later that day. When I was younger, my dad and I went deep sea fishing all the time. The creepiest thing that ever happened to me was when we decided to do a little more surface fishing further out on the open ocean, rather than fish for grouper and whatnot. So I'm sitting with my feet off the edge of the boat and my dad hooks a fish. It seems pretty big based on the way it was pulling, so I look over to see if he needs help. Then something slowly brushes my legs. I looked down and there was a four or five geet barracuda brushing against my legs. I froze and seconds later it shot off. When my dad felt the line go slack, he started reeling in faster. The barracuda had bitten off most of the fish. It was only a mouth on a hook, really. Pretty creepy. Me and my grandpa were walking a deer trail along a five-foot-wide thicket with clear cuts on both sides. It was a peaceful day, with the sun shining through the trees and the sound of birds chirping in the distance. Little did we know that this walk would take a turn towards the mysterious and unknown. As we walked, engrossed in our conversation about hunting and the great outdoors, it was my grandfather who first noticed something strange. He abruptly stopped and muttered, What the bleep is that? His tone made me stop in my tracks and look in the direction he was pointing. There, in the soft soil near the trail, was the biggest footprint I had ever seen. It was deep and wide, easily twice the size of my own foot. The imprint resembled that of a giant creature, and I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. The kicker to all this was that it was my grandpa's last year of hunting. Due to a cataract in one eye, his doctor advised him to give up hunting. It was a bittersweet moment for him, as he had been an avid hunter his whole life. And now, in his final year, he stumbled upon something truly mysterious. Curiosity peaked, 
I began searching for any other signs that could lead us to the creature responsible for that enormous footprint. We scanned the surrounding area looking for tracks, broken branches, or any other evidence of its presence. But to our dismay, we couldn't find anything else. Despite the lack of additional signs, the sighting had spooked me enough to shift my focus from searching for deer to searching for what made that track. When I was 12, I lived out in 29 Palms, California in the middle of the desert. One night around June 14, 2015, I remember being awake in the middle of the night to a black silhouette that was shaped just like a short gray. It was staring straight down at me and I was staring at its face. It had its hand on my forehead and its skin was so abnormally smooth, soft and warm. I was filled with pure love and tranquility. I intuitively knew that everything was going to be okay. My mind was completely clear of any thoughts, as if it was controlling my mind. And for some reason, it started making me count upward in my head. Once I got to three, I went unconscious. I eventually woke up again, still laying in bed, and everything in the room was the same except the entity was just gone. I sat up and immediately thought WEF was that, and what just happened? I was able to think again, and I was just so confused at what this all meant. I often question whether or not that intensely reassuring feeling was actually supposed to mean something, or if it was just a way for it to make me relax, so it could do what it came to do. But I just don't understand why it seemed to have let me remember that moment instead of making me just forget the entire experience. I may not ever know. This was in an area where there was a clear cut on the far side of the ravine which had a creek running through it. There was a logging road where I camped. If I remember correctly, there was a sign attached to a tree stating Dewalt 16. This was a few miles off the highway to Crater Lake and 50 miles from the parking lot at the Virginia Domiciliary at White City. The sound I heard was a loud bois, which I never heard before or since. It lasted perhaps three seconds, and I could not determine the exact direction. I did not try to discover the source of the sound, as there was thick underbrush. Earlier, there had been cattle in the area. Doors were tightly barred in Hong Kong as the search for a hairy beast unfolded. Terrified residents shared stories of a shaggy creature standing over six feet tall, sending waves of fear through the community. Among them was La Chu, a village gardener who had an encounter with the beast and lived to tell a tale. It was a day like any other when I found myself face to face with this mysterious creature. I was tending to my duties near the family temple, approximately 50 yards away, when the unthinkable occurred. Suddenly, out of the shadows, the beast appeared before me, its entire body covered in long, shaggy gray hair. To my astonishment, it stood upright, assuming a posture that resembled a human. Without a moment's hesitation, instinct took over, and I unleashed a powerful punch towards its stomach. The blow connected, causing the creature to momentarily falter. However, my triumph was short-lived as it swiftly fell upon me and we engaged in a desperate struggle. We grappled and wrestled, locked in a fierce battle for what felt like an eternity. Eventually, the creature abruptly disengaged, retreating into the distance, its form shifting as it loped away on all fours. I was left bewildered and shaken, trying to comprehend the surreal encounter that had just unfolded before my very eyes. The encounter had left an indelible mark on my psyche, forever etching the image of that shaggy beast into my memory. Not long after my encounter, the tales of this enigmatic creature continued to circulate. A woman reported witnessing a strange animal galloping past her vegetable garden, moving swiftly on all fours. As proof of her sighting, she presented large triangular footprints imprinted in the soft earth, distinctly different from those made by a human or an ape. The community was thrown into a state of uncertainty and fear as the search for answers intensified. 
speculation swirled and theories were born, attempting to unravel the truth behind this hairy beast that had sent shockwaves through Hong Kong. As the days turned into weeks, the search for the creature continued and the collective hope for understanding grew. But amidst the fear and uncertainty, there was also a sense of awe, a recognition that our world holds mysteries far beyond our comprehension. To this day, the memory of that encounter remains vivid in my mind. It serves as a constant reminder that in the vast tapestry of our existence, there are forces and creatures that defy conventional understanding, urging us to embrace the enigmatic wonders that lie hidden within our world. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.